classifications there is this we have many classifications and uh, you can use any classification but main thing is you should know that uh, what type of defect you are going to cause once you remove the mucormycosis uh, from the maxilla so mostly it is either a, a dental or defect or it is slightly higher involving the uh, lower part up to the lower part of the zygoma so these are low level osteotomies these are the main indications for the the for the rehabilitation with the prosthesis along with the zygomatic and other implants then you can see that there are other can be other card other type of maxillectomy is also which we can call it the high level maxillectomy which involves as part of uh, orbit also and part of zygoma bone also or you can call it as a subtotal or total maxillectomy is also these cases are difficult because we are removing the part of zygoma also then it is difficult to restore them with the zygomatic implants and such a thin zygomatic arch bone is remaining in which you may be able to place implant initially but the long term success of that implant is difficult and then these are these are the vertical part of the maxillectomy when we talk about the horizontal part of the osteo maxillectomy you can see that it can be a central defect if it is a central defect mid parallel defect of course there is no role of uh, implant in that that can be done with the surgery only but if it is a defect which along which is involving the dental part also like the defect b c and d then you know that these defects can either be treated with a prosthesis only or a surgery plus prosthesis can you uh, make out which type of defect is more difficult to do it with the zygomatic implants these of course uh, central part necrosis or central part defect we will not treat with the zygomatic implant but the defect of type b in which a unilateral defect is there and anterior teeth are present so these are very difficult to treat with the zygomatic implant because there is very lack of uh, very less space present uh, present there for the long zygomatic drill and long zygomatic implant placement so most of the time you end up placing your zygomatic implant somewhere in the second premolar or the molar region only it is very difficult to place your implant in the canine region or the first premolar region because this canine or premolar will interfere with the handpiece or the long drills and then there can be other type of cases in which we remove the entire dentition or only dentition or along with the mucosa also so your treatment planning depends on whether it is dental defect only or it is a composite defect that is dental or plus palatal mucosa only, plus palatal mucosa also because if it is a dental or defect only then you know we you will agree that it can be easily treated with the prosthesis and the implant but if it is a composite defect then uh, you have to decide whether you want to go for only prosthesis or you want to replace the soft tissue with some type, some sort of flap or some sort of uh, microvascular surgery and then you want to like to go for implant and you have to decide one thing also that you want to place implant first and then you want to go for soft tissue uh, correction or you want to go for soft tissue correction first and then you want to go for implant or you want to do it both the things simultaneously that is the soft tissue uh, surgery and the implant placement simultaneously and third thing is in composite type of defect uh, suppose if you decide that i would like to do it only with the prosthesis then you will decide what type of processes you would like to use you would like to use only acrylic or metal acrylic or metal ceramic so that is why uh, identifying the defect and the planning is more important uh, this is uh, there are few pictures which i have taken from a book of dr bainmark uh, such a old pictures these are but they you can see that how effectively they have demonstrated the use of zygomatic and other implants in these type of maxillectomy cases so you can see that as apart from zygomatic implants zygomatic implants remains only in premolar region so you need pterygoid implant also and you need anterior implant also to stabilize the prosthesis and anterior implant also you would like to see that there is sufficient bone available above the root apices so there is no need to remove any anterior tooth which is falling into aesthetic region just to place an implant so if you have sufficient bone if you have preoperative cbct data majority of time you can place this type of angulated implant to place in the anterior region angulated or even horizontal also so you can compensate for anterior cantilever this is another uh, picture taken from the same book and you can see that apart from zygomatic implant anterior implant and pterygoid implant there is another uh, place where sometimes you can find the bone that is the lateral wall of the nose so if you have not removed the lateral wall of nose during the maxillectomy that is the low level maxillectomy you have done there are many uh, good there are good chances that you can and then in case if you don't have any bone in pterygoid region 
there are certain uh, incidences in which they have placed two anterior implants also you can see quite horizontally they are placed just to increase the uh, decrease the cantilever and increase the bone implant contact so same type of uh, uh, same type of planning we have used in our cases also and after placement of implant the, the type of processes depends on whether we have a soft tissue defect or not like this case she had a entire uh, maxilla was necrosed you can see this was our, uh, before we did the maxillectomy the entire maxilla was uh, lower level of maxilla was necro so we removed the entire maxilla along with the pterygoid plates so you can see the pterygoid plates dental portion and the palatal portion was removed and this was after healing you can see the facial deformity and this is soft tissue healing so this is one of the biggest problem even while of removing the maxillary um, while doing the maxillectomy the palatal bone was uh, the palatal mucosa it it was apparently intact but during healing we lost many of the palatal mucosa many uh, a big part of palatal mucosa and you can see that the inferior turbinates are visible and there is communication to the nose also and to the sinus also and then uh, because the luckily in this patient zygoma was uh, zygomatic bone was okay so again uh, and pterygoids have you, you have seen that we remove the pterygoids so we placed four zygomas like this and then later on we gave him gave her a bar retained over denture because she was having a multiple oral, oral enteral or oral nasal communications so uh, removal prosthesis was given to her on a bar like this and after, after prosthesis she had improvement in the facial aesthetics also so this was the bar which uh, uh, studs over which the denture was stabilized so you can give a removable denture uh, removable prosthesis over the zygomatic implants this was another case she also lost her entire maxilla during the maxillectomy and during the healing phase you can see that soft tissue defects were not much so again we decided to go for zygomatic implants and on the right uh, on the left side you see pterygoid bone was also available so we placed four zygomatic implants again two anterior two posterior and one pterygoid implant so this pterygoid implant is important in this case and after healing because the soft tissue defect was not that big so we could give a fixed prosthesis a screw tent prosthesis a metal ceramic prosthesis now the important thing is the placement of zygomatic implant you should place two zygomatic implants on one side like that that should be sufficient anterior posterior spread so initially there are this is a common mistake that you place your zygomatic implant too close to each other then this implant will come somewhere here in the premolar region so it will lead to a very big cantilever anteriorly so you have to take care that these implant should have a proper distance or should have a anterior post it should have a proper ap spread and another important thing is placement of pterygoid implant in this case because if you don't place the pterygoid implant the molar region will be cantilevered in this case so if you have pterygoid bone present so definitely place or try to place a pterygoid implant in this case you can see that we have placed a long pterygoid implant or you can see we had sufficient amount of bone available in the pterygoid region so we could place a zygomatic implant in the pterygoid bone this is post op cbct and you can see the zygomatic implant placed in the pterygoid region so we had almost 30 to 40 mm bone available in the pterygoid region so we prefer to place a zygomatic implant in that area also this is the zygomatic cross section of the zygomatic implant in pterygoid region and these are the cross section of the zygomatic you can see the remarkable improvement in our appearance after the prosthesis the same type of another case you can see the loss of maxilla and the uh, well, the pathetic facial appearance after the loss of maxilla so this was his uh, condition after removal of the maxilla and before going for implant placement so again we did the same thing because we had removed the pterygoid in this region so we could place only four zygomatic implant in this case and then over the zygomatic implant we, again we could place a metal ceramic fixed prosthesis because the openings were very small and we could cover those opening with the prosthesis only i was like to uh, bring your attention to this implant see this implant is in 
correct position it has gone to very anteriorly so that the anterior uh, anterior cantilever is minimized had this implant was also here i would be very happy so uh, we should take care while placing the implant that the anterior implant should come out as anteriorly as possible and you uh, just uh, check this emergence also so this emergence of the right zygo anterior zygomatic implant is quite away from the junction of the palatal and the buccal mucosa so we will discuss it later also that this is the mistake we do while placing the zygomatic implant anterior zygomatic implant this is his final processes and this is his opg this was another same type of case you can see the entire mucosa um, entire maxilla is necrosed buccal and uh, entire everything was mobile so we removed the entire maxilla but fortunately pterygoid was were preserved so this is after healing and then again we placed four zygoma means quad zygoma and uh, two pterygoid also in this case so you can see this is post op cvct with quad zygoma and two pterygoids and now by that time we have learned that in the quad zygoma we have to place it parallel to the inferior margin of the orbit so anterior implant if you can place it parallel to the inferior margin of the orbit there can be sufficient gap between the these two implant and they will come out quite anteriorly also so this is uh, his facial appearance before prosthesis and this is implants after healing after a few months and this is his fixed prosthesis metal acrylic because he had some gaps here so we wanted to realign the prosthesis again and again that is not possible with the uh, metal ceramic one so finally we could give him a fixed prosthesis on the zygomatic and the pterygoid implant so if you have bone you always use the pterygoid bone along with the zygomatic implant and then coming to the unilateral cases now unilateral cases are much more difficult to treat because you don't have sufficient space available for placement of zygomatic implant in the proper position like this was the case you can see the uh, buccal abscesses the palatal abscesses so we had to remove the maxilla a part of the maxilla on the right side this is after healing now you can see that this canine is present here so if you want to place one implant coming out here in the premolar region your hand piece will always touch this canine so it will not be possible to bring your implant somewhere here so you need an either you remove the canine or you had to place an anterior implant here so now this is how we did it we placed an anterior implant here like those showed in on those in those diagram these are two zygomatic implants so you can see the best uh, possible uh, placement of the anterior zygomatic implant was quite away from the canine region this was his fixed prosthesis given so you can see this anterior imp implant becomes important now so now it uh, it's on your choice if you want you can remove the sound anterior to or if you want you can bypass these uh, root roots and you can place the implant over the bone which is per, uh, the bone which is present over the apexes apexes of the incisors so this is very commonly used now uh, we use it very commonly this again you can see that these implants are you can see that this implant is coming out only in the premolar region so there was a big cantilever here so we had to place a an anterior implant and the posterior implant was coming out in the molar region so we were satisfied in this case you can see these implants are almost crossing each other so what happened actually we placed the posterior implant first took out in the molar region then we tried to place the anterior implant so that is why we had the anterior implant though it came out anteriorly we had to use the posterior border of the zygoma and it came out like a crossing so this is another case we did you can see the right side of maxilla has been removed and the preoperative facial disfigurement is quite evident but the zygoma was fortunately uh, uh, healthy so we exposed the zygoma and this is important once you expose the zygoma then you remove this bone which is overlying the base of the zygoma so that you can see the base of the zygoma clearly now you can see the base of the zygoma clearly and then we placed one two or then we first we placed two implants then we found that there is sufficient bone available in between these two implants so we placed three third zygomatic implant also but the most important thing i would like to uh, bring in your notices the um, how could we place the anterior implant this implant was 60 mm long and we could place it only because uh, first of all central and uh, central and lateral central was missing and then we extracted the lateral incisor also 
And so that is why we got sufficient amount of horizontal space available so that we can place this longer implant. If we would not, if we would not have removed these incisors, then it was not possible to place this. So one anterior implant and three zygoma implants. Pterygoid was already not there. This is after healing. And then this was a metal ceramic obturator type of thing was cisplatin was made. And then we were able to close the defect nicely. There was no nasal regurgitation. Rather in this case, what has happened when you need a uh, problem after once we close this defect with the obturator, she has started having nasal dripping from the contralateral nose while she, she was eating. You can see improvement in the prosthesis, improvement in the appearance. This was our final uh, OPG is the three zygomatic implant and anti implant, and these are the CBCT post ops. Another type of unilateral case, same thing we did. This is after healing. So, again, since we did it, extracted this pre uh, canine region, so we could not bring our implant quite anteriorly. So, we placed two zygoma, one pterygoid in this region. And in this case, we did some uh, digital impressions and digital prosthesis fabrications. But finally, it came out very nicely. This is his final OPG. So, so two zygoma and one pterygoid. This was another case. This case, I'm just showing the same uh, the same technique we used, but because we had sufficient bone in the pterygoid region. So we wanted to place, see you the pterygoid plates in the lower part, they are damaged, but in the upper part in the pterygoid region, there is sufficient bone in the sufficient sphenoid bone was there. So we decided to go for a long zygomatic implant and engage this sphenoid bone here. But this was not possible without doing a guided surgery because this bone has shifted quite medially and it was not possible to uh, uh, place the implant free-handedly into this uh, angle. So we just made a guide for this uh, using the ETX Pro software. Once first the pilot drill guide, we first did the pilot drilling, took the OPG. Once we verified it that it is in the same uh, right plane, then we used the uh, next guide, which has uh, for, which was actually made for noble active, and we used the same guide for the zygomatic implant placement. So place zygomatic implant through the guide into the pterygoid region, and then the remaining anterior implants you can see. This was flapless zygoma implant in the pterygoid region, then two zygoma into the zygomatic bone, and one anterior implant above the apices of the central and lateral and canine region. So these are the, you can see this is the zygomatic implant in the pterygoid region, again, which was then guided. And this was a temporary prosthesis was given immediately. Now uh, we are just in the trial stage of our final prosthesis. This is our metal trial, and uh, soon we'll be giving her a permanent prosthesis also. So you can see that this is another case we have done recently also. So you can see that the, the I just want to look, uh, bring your focus for the anterior implant. So there is sufficient bone most of the time available above and behind the root apexes. So you can see this is the central incisor and there is sufficient bone available and the lateral incisor and then in the canine region. So if you have CBCT pre-op, you can plan this type of uh, implant placement. So you can see this is the uh, picture while placing the implant placement. This is this blue line is denoting the root and above the root, you have sufficient space available for the implant placement. So before winding up the cases, I just like to show you one case, which has given us the confidence that in these type of defect, which are open, but still we can close it with the prosthesis. And if you are able to close the nasal regurgitation, stop the nasal regurgitation, patient is usually happy, nothing is going to happen because we have seven year follow-up of this patient and he is still in touch and he doesn't have any problem with the prosthesis. So this was his pre-operative CBCT. This was after when the maxilla was removed. This was his defect. And then we placed two zygoma, one anterior implant and one pterygoid implant in this case. And we gave the same type of metal ceramic prosthesis years back. Just close the defect with the prosthesis only. You can see. And now you can see this is this picture is taken after years. And this patient often comes to us for follow-up and he never have any problem because of that defect or he never have nasal regurgitation or something. Whenever we remove this, we find some cresting over the implants. 
that is the secretions which is accumulate, accumulated over the implants and apart from that as such there is no sinusitis or no uh, cellulitis nothing no problem is there to this patient so that gave us the confidence that in, instead of going for a flap surgery and then go for implant placement you can first you should try with the prosthesis and if the prosthesis is not helpful then we can go for a perforator flap uh, either radial forearm and then you can go or temporalis and then we can go see you can use the same or different processes you can see the improvement of the patient what lessons we have learned is first thing is in the anterior implant you can see that the zygomatic implants in the normal patient they are quite at an angle because the ridge is quite low from the zygomatic bone but in the maxillectomy cases you can see that we have to because the soft because we have removed the maxilla and the zygomatic implant ends up almost horizontally because it is almost horizontal you can see that these type of cases where the implant is coming out horizontally and you have removed as uh, suppose if you if you use a zero degree implant and you have used a 60 degree abutment here so it was possible to place this abutment because that time surgery everything was open but now once you have done the surgery and healing has occurred now how suppose in case with future suppose this abutment become loose or if you want to change the process whatever problem happens how will you open this abutment because it is covered with the soft tissue so in, in and still unless you give an incision here you cannot open this abutment so this is a big problem and with a 60 degree abutment or 52 degree abutment because their channel is almost horizontal so implant horizontal as well as the multi unit abutment opening is horizontal it makes a lot of uh, difficulties during the implant placement and in the abutment placement also you can see that this in this case also the uh, driver is almost touching the para contralateral parietal mucosa so it was very difficult and not only driver the insertion tool is also touching the parietal mucosa so this is the problem with the straight implant so if the, uh, my suggestion is if you are using quad zygoma the entire implant should be at the 45 degree and the rest of the implant you can use zero degree another lesson which we have learned is you can see that many a times you have encountered see this was before placement of implant and this is after placement of implant so once you give during the placement of implant if you give the incision at the same junction of the buccal and the parietal mucosa most of the time there is post operative lesions and these openings are there so now we have modified this and now we have started giving incision on the buccal side we don't give incision at the junction of the parietal and the buccal mucosa we give incision quite away from the, this junction in the buccal mucosa leaving some soft tissue on the uh, parietal side also so we'll give incision like this so we don't give incision here at the junction of parietal buccal mucosa so it is easy and after that we have never encountered any lesions there another lesson which we have learned is you can see that uh, uh, while uh, when you do the maxillectomy and when you do the suturing this uh, the junction of the parietal and the buccal mucosa this comes quite palatal and by default when you do the surgery you tend intend to finish your entire implant at this junction only but you forget that uh, this will lead to a big cantilever anteriorly so initially we used to place our implant like this now we have realized that this implant has comes should have, have come slight and more anteriorly so that this anterior cantilever should be minimized so you can see that this much amount of anterior cantilever we could have minimized if we would have placed our implant somewhere here so when you place a uh, quad zygoma always remember that anterior posterior implant is in should come out in the molar region and anterior implant should come out as anteriorly as possible but always remember when you place your anterior implant don't uh, do this mistake that those both implants converge into the zygomatic bone you have to keep your anterior implant as parallel to the infraorbital margin so that there should be some gap between these two implant then this is another uh, very interesting uh, post op complication we have seen this was during the final placement of the uh, prosthesis then i realized that can you see this some green thing which is stuck there between the mucosa when i remove this can you see this is the light body which has penetrated while taking the impression and it has entered into it so if i would not have noticed it if this would have lying light there and probably this might have caused some infection or dis, uh, discomfort to the patient so this is another thing which we have to remember keep remember that when you take this type of in, impression first fill these defect with the cotton and then take the impression and the last uh, complication which is very very uh, uh, can said uh, depressing and disappointing is failure of your implant so i have seen that i have uh, we have almost done 26 to 30 cases uh including uh, in college and in my private practice also and out of those cases uh, four in four patient we had implant failures 
and on all the four patients we had got very good initial primary stability so we decided to load them in, in uh, load them uh, in, immediately and you can see that this uh, five i placed five zygomatic implant in this case you can see one implant in the pterygoid region also and uh, she went through the entire process a uh, prosthetic process you can see this was the opc with the with the transfer copings also and then uh, while we, we called her for the final prosthesis at that time uh, this implant this implant and this they were all moving and then ca they came out just like that so we had to place because the diwali was nearby so we had to place our entire final prosthesis on the two implants only now waiting for that zygoma to heal and uh, waiting for that patient to gain the courage again to get few more zygomas if possible in this case so these are very depressing uh, uh, situations because you know that you may not be able to place zygoma again in this case and uh, now how to answer the patient also so what we have decided uh, we have uh, modified the protocol is now we don't do the immediate loading i don't do the immediate loading in mucor cases i place the implants either i leave them sub uh, some mucosal or if they are exposed then i splint them with a bar but i don't load them i wait till three to four months and then only i load them thank you very much if you have any questions uh, you can ask here also or then you have my contacts also thank you thank you sir thank you so much sir it was an elaborating and uh, it was i can say that it's encouraging for the new implant lords like us to go ahead in this uh, field of zygomatic implants and your courage to use the zygomatic implants in the pterygoid region is extraordinary <laughs> thank you so much sir and uh, we'll take all the questions and answers in the panel discussion sir okay, okay. so uh, if we have any uh, queries regarding the i i think so uh, sankalp sir will not be available in the panel discussions but we we will try to do the justice on his behalf during the panel discussion thank you so much sir we really thank appreciate you. sir thank you thank you yeah so our next presenter is uh the next presentation is rehabilitation after muco mucormycosis using the glabella implants uh this lecture is by dr vivek gaur now this is a pre recorded lecture so, uh, so and as we have gone through his lectures it's bit a long uh, a uh, long session which he has given us so what we will try to do is that we will try to do the justice to our subject which is regarding the glabella implant so in some cases if we find that the sub subject is going somewhat out side to the main topic we will try to go put it in a forward mode so now we will be starting this pre recorded lecture by dr vivek gaur please give us a few minutes
yes we will uh, we know that the sound is not there so please give us a few minutes we'll, we'll what we'll do is we'll start the proceeding again Good evening, everyone. A oh, good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Vivek Gaur. I am a oromaxofacial surgeon, and I am doing the implants from since 2003 onwards. And from 2010 onwards, I do only the major functional loading implantology. I am very thankful and grateful to have an opportunity to do my presentation on glabra implant. It's an advanced tool for post-resected mucormycosis rehabilitation. Now I have, we have to actually focus on the mucormycosis because we, if we want to rehabilitate the mucormycosis affected actually bone, so we need to focus on mucormycosis. So it's an and it's an epidemic with a pandemic, and you know actually what is the epidemic is there? It's a COVID nineteen. What we are having, it is caused by the phylum zygo uh, zygo mycota, and it's associated with the what are the factors are there when the uncontrolled diabetes mellitus is there. and because of that we have the keto acidosis will be there and if we are giving a is uh, injudiciously we are uh, we were giving the corticosteroids actually when the patients were coming of the covid 19 and uh, they were having the respiratory distresses were there and of course if the patient is having a neutropenia or the patient gone under bone marrow transplantation there is a more chance are there to have a mucormycosis and when there is a trauma is there burn is there if you are having a immunosuppressive therapy is there pressure injury is there what is the pressure injury you know nowadays because the respiratory distress was there the patient was about they were having a uh, the, the for the extra for the oxygen support they have to wear the mask actually and the and the mask uh, it will be it's like uh, they are not loose actually they have been tightened properly uh, when we are having in the icus and these always create a pressure necrosis actually they are they are creating a pressure on the jaws on the maxilla and this also one of the factors there that we were having the mucormycosis and of course it's a nosocomial common infection is there because if we are having a prolonged uh, the stays then the icu in the hospital so there's very much chances are there that your if when your immunity is low then always the opportunity infection like the mucormycosis and this fungus is they going to catch up so how it happens in mucormycosis there is extensive ngo invasion is there and which leads to vascular thrombosis there will be tissue necrosis be there when the tissue necrosis is there so the drug therapy actually what you have what we are doing it to control the mucormycosis is not possible because of the necrosis of the tissue 
and the end result is like uh, the medications are not going to get uh, properly at the targeted site and when there is a tissue angio invasion is there like it is a disseminated mycomycosis will be there it's going to spread to the nearby adjacent sites also leading to thromboembolism and thromboembolism if it's there actually again there will be a uh, the necrosis of the tissue will be there and the situation will be somewhat like the osteomyelitis that happen okay but it's not a bacterial osteomyelitis huh? so if you are talking about a mycomycosis and if you are talking about the covid 19 affected mycomycosis what are the type of the mycomycosis is there we have we were facing actually this angio invasion it can decimate to the adjacent sites also hmm. so primary cutaneous is like gradual fulminant and secondary cutaneous is it start is a stage one stage two is three stage there why i am specifically telling you about because this is really when the glabella implant will be needed in stage one there is sino nasal region will be involved stage two like sinus uh, sino orbital involvement and then the intracranial involvement will be there so when we i have operated the patients actually where the where the frontal uh, sinus was also involved in the mycomycosis so and we are having a common situation where the orbital excentration has been done because of the extensive uh, the uh, because extensive necrosis of the bone because of mycomycosis but it really starts from the sino nasal region so you will find out the patients always you are going to find out the patients some 90% 90% fresh patient are you are going to find out where there is initially actually the rhinectomy partial rhinectomy has been done terminate has been removed and maybe a uh, some part of the alveolar bone or the maxilla has been removed okay so this is the stage one you are going to uh, most common the situation are there now we are talking about the mycomycosis and we uh, as we know the primary in uh, the etiologic factor actually or the pre precipitating factor of the mycomycosis is a diabetes actually what what is the diabetes the hyperglycemia will be there so <laughs> actually what happened when a patient is having a, a, a patient is in a hyperglycemic stage because this is actually how the prognosis we are going to know the prognosis of the affected bone and this bone is not a normal bone when it is affected by the hyperglycemia in hyperglycemia what is having micro and, mic and macro vascular complications are there it means it means the bone the quality of the bone or quality of the buttress is in, is in a state of low mineralization the neutrophil lymphocyte function will be there that means the 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 resistance actually to fight an infection from the bone is not going to be there and the chemotaxin phagocytosis are going to be affected actually because of the because of the vascular micro and macro vascular complica complications so if the site become complicated if the site get infected the the zygoma or actually the corticals or the or the pterygoids so you will find out that the the healing or actually uh, the healing is delayed or healing is not possible that's why we are doing actually the resection of the site and of course Uh, the bone is in a state of very low mineralization, and we are about to place an implant on that bone. So this is very important. So it will be infection will be there, and osteoblastic cell proliferation and collagen production will get affected. And when it's going to affect it again, it lead to the low mineralization of the bone. The strength, the healing, and won't be there actually. Okay, very delayed healing will be there. Diminished mechanical property will be there. If you are going to place an implant, bone to implant contact will be very less. And of course, it's all the factors are there. So there are always a chance of the secondary. bacterial invasion will be there and for such cases if we are doing immediate function loading implant logy or we are loading the implants without having a proper equip or actually we have without having a proper number of the implants of the fixtures then we are actually seeing a or we are heading towards a failure and what the thing can happen like what we can what the thing can happen when the patients already lost lot uh, have lost the uh, the bone or the the maxilla and if we whatever the part is left and we are placing an implant if we are not doing the treatment properly again actually the patient if a failure is there then i don't think so anything will be left to do the to complete actually the rehabilitation of such patient so what are the challenges and considerations challenges and considerations are if you are placing an implant 
the bone is very very least mineralized prone for secondary infection so i prefer the smooth surface implants there's a delayed healing is there so in the delayed healing is there better to do when a bone content is low mineralization better to do the delayed healing actually or fix the processes and let us wait actually fix the splint the implant and let's wait the processes for the mastication after four months there is too much of isolasticity is there so when the isolasticity is there and the anterior part of the bone is not there or anterior part of the maxilla is not there like i'm indicating for the quad zygoma is and all so those implants actually the quad zygoma or the zygomatic implant they were introduced the professor bremark has later protocol the anterior fixtures are needed actually to support the zygoma and when we are having a such a compromised bone situation is there and we are doing a quad zygoma without having an any anterior fixture so there is going to be the isolasticity from the bone so we want if we want to minimize the pontic span ap spread so idea is the, the anterior part posterior spread actually or at them or the pontic span should be minimized actually for a better prognosis and we should do the gradual loading of the of the on over the implants because the mineral content is low and when we do a gradual content as of frost analysis or the wool's law the mineral content is going to increase with function and the bone is going to pick up mm. so what's a glabular implant a glabular implant i have laid a definition it's a fixture engaged at nasal prime frontal nasal suture frontal sinus floor providing the support for apesthesis maxillary construction but need to be resultantly splinted with fixtures placed laterally or posteriorly thus restoring the stomatoc nasal system means with a individual glabular implant you are not going to put any crown with a individual like zygoma you are not going to to do a loading of only individual or single zygoma or a single pterygoid they are need to be splinted together so these are the structures are there you what are the target site is their target size is actually where the the upper part of the nasal bone and the frontal sinus are getting fused this glabella is not the whole and whole the part of the glabella is not mineralized please understand the floor of maxillary uh, the floor of frontal sinus there is not all the floor of the frontal sinus is highly mineralized there is a particular point is there where the glabella implant has to be engaged to have a good insertion talk and a better prognosis so this is the point actually where where the nasion is there okay or or uh, where the fusion of the frontal floor of the frontal sinus and the nas and the nasal bone is there okay that is the point where we need to, we have to engage the implant otherwise the the content the the stability won't be there so these are the some of the pictures are there mm. but that is an idea actually how we should be doing the implants the glabella implant the glabella implant has to be splinted along with the zygoma and the pterygoid whatever the bone is available the indication advantage of a glabella is if there is no bone pre maxilla is there no buttress available if the rhinectomy has been done partial or complete or the maxillectomy anterior or complete and to do the intrahall rehabilitation or of course we can have a nasal apesthesis for the extra oral rehabilitation what is the rationale the rationale behind a glabella implant is we need to have a rationale behind is we need to have a buttress anchorage should be there tripodation we need to have a tripodation if the two glabellas two two zygomatic implant is there one glabella is there what we are getting we are getting a tripodation and resist the lateral forces so this is a true tripodation of the maxilla we can do with the glabella and of course we minimize the pontic span mm -hmm. so there are the two in design of the implants are available but if i want to do a glabella i need a smooth surface fixture like a toulouse leg screw base so this is the proper fixture or the zd implants are there or like a bcs implant that we can do the glabella implant i am never going to test the rough surface implant and that region so these are the buttresses what we are going to engage the maxilla is full of the buttresses for us actually what we are going to do we maybe we are engaging the conference of the middle transverse facial buttresses and we are actually uh, the nasal maxillary buttresses is there centro ethmoidal buttresses there these are the conferences there at the nasian region or at the glabella region that we are going to engage but what is the importance of a buttress engagement the best part of the buttress engagement is like if a bone remodeling happens first of all the cell osteoclast will be there and then the osteoblast will be there but the 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 indications or actually the signal is sent by the osteocytes only so in in the in the 
in the this buttresses osteocytes in the bone mattress act as a pressure sensors in the buttresses and there is a pressure sensitive network among osteocytes osteoblast and osteoclast the stress caused by the associated muscles prevent generation of osteoclast and increase activation of osteoblast and buttresses making it ideal for immediate loading of fixture and what is a buttresses buttresses are also always attached actually by the muscles so anatomical consideration frontal sinus frontal nasal suture orbital content nasion nasal cavity anterior nasal spine and neurovascular structure this are this we have to look actually when you are planning for the glabella implant or you would you should have actually the idea of these structures now let's focus on the frontal sinus we just say the frontal sinus and we cannot move on that we want to engage the frontal uh, the floor of the frontal sinus it's not like that frontal sinus is as asymmetrical or asymmetrical and there is a respiratory epithelium like uh, in the embryological degree there is a respiratory epithelium and osteoclast interaction will be there and that define the size of the frontal sinus. Frontal sinus give an indicator of the growth of the mandible. It is a predictor of the mandible growth pattern. If a large frontal sinus is there, there will be longer condyles will be there, wider symphysis and the cases become class 3 wall occlusion. What does that mean? It means if your patient is having a large frontal sinus will be there, then the placement of the glabular implant will be very difficult actually. Because if you want to place an implant, glabular implant, there will be always inter interference will be coming from the path of insertion from the mandible that will be more protruded outside. Of course, actually, if a patient is having a large frontal sinus, there is anti larger anterior facial height is there, and there is a decrease in clinician anterior cranial basis there. That's again actually it creates a problem when you are placing an implant, like the glabular implant in the path of insertion. And of course, the we are studying the frontal sinus, we have assessment of development maturity is also there. So you look actually at the frontal sinus, floor of the frontal sinus. So what is the idea? Where actually you want to place a glabular implant? Glabular implant that we want to, if we want to engage the floor frontal sinus, it is not like that we can engage anywhere, as I told. But you should remember the frontal sinus, the anterior posterior width, the anterior posterior area of the frontal sinus is maximum one centimeter, and five millimeter at the uh, or the or the width or the base of the frontal sinus is also one centimeter. If what I mean, I mean actually, if you are going to place an implant. And if the one, if this implant, glabular implant, more slip posteriorly, one centimeter posteriorly actually to the nasion area, you are going to you are going to perforate the cribriform plate, and that means you are you will be in a cranial cavity. And if your implant, you are placing an implant, just deviate five millimeter on the either side, then the nasal, then the orbital contents are there. Okay, now in the path, nasal acumen duct will be there. Orbital contact means. Uh, the medial canthal ligament is also there and you are going to perforate that thing you are going to get a great injury to the orbit mm. so this is has to this all the things has to take consideration so that's the fusion of the nasal bone and frontal bone that is the ideal site is there most predictable and minimized site for the glabular implant some of the pictures now the area actually what have be means this the the nerve are which is actually supplied to the nasal cavity or to the glabular area is actually you are having a, uh, the vessels are like ophthalmic artery and supratropular artery is there and there's a branches actually of the facial artery is there, angular branches there and this is and this also ophthalmic and supraorbital artery are the branch of the internal carotid artery is there, angular and the angular artery is the branch of the facial artery is there which is a branch of the external carotid artery. So this angular artery is actually the confluence or it is where the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery are getting anastomized. And so the nerve actually, you are having basically this area get the blood, uh, the nerve supply actually from the zygomatical facial nerve, which is a branch actually of the maxillary nerve. And of course, from the infraorbital uh, nerve also, uh, you are having the infraorbital artery, infraorbital nerve actually, they are, they are providing each sensation or providing the input actually to the nasal cavity or to the glabular area. So, this is a, another picture for you. Mm -hmm. Now, as we go actually again to the vascular supply. So, as I told, the spino, these are this area is getting uh, uh, this area it is getting actually the blood supply from the max from the internal maxillary artery. Internal maxillary artery you are going to get actually from the uh, intercarotid artery actually branch of intercarotid artery like the ophthalmic artery and you are going to get the branch from the facial artery also like the angular artery so these are the confluences are there but what I want to tell you if you look at the literal wall of the nose 
if you want to look at a little one of the lows the arteries and supplies are more prominent either actually on the base of the nose on the entry aspect of the nose or they are the emergence are they in the posterior aspect of the nose or nasal cavity but at the glabular region there is a minimum actually or there is no uh, the vessels are present so that is why this is what i want to point it out and if you want to look at the at the nasal septum again the nasal septum the anterior part the anterior inferior part of the nasal septum is having a the blood supply is there confluence of blood supply is there actually and there is a uh, if you injure that area uh, that's a Kesselbeck area is there if you injure it that area, your little back area is there if you can influence if you injure that area there won't be high bleeding will be there but as you go as you go to actually to the superior aspect there is not much of actually the blood supply or the vessels are present so this i want to emphasize this technique has to be safe technique for us so what we do actually when you are going to do the implant uh, when you are placing glabella implant i am going to do the supratrochlear supraorbital nerve block i am going to do but that nerve block has to be there without the adrenaline that is what i want to emphasize but with the adrenaline you give us infraorbital nerve block you can do it and and at the later aspect of the nose also you can do the infiltration and if the palate is available or if some part of the palate is available then you can put in uh, the infiltration otherwise there won't be any area available so infraorbital supra infra, uh, infraorbital nerve block and supraorbital nerve block will is going to be sufficient to place a glabella implant what's the target side as i told you always the confluence actually of the of the nasal bone and the frontal floor this is the target area is there and one centimeter posterior to the area is the is the cribriform plate is there the cranial cavity is there five millimeter to the either side of the middle of that area is the orbital content will be there so it is a highly precise target area will be there it's not a joke what i'm telling you it's a highly precise target area is there so there are some pictures you can see this is a picture at the cranial view you can see the frontal sinus okay anterior to the frontal side you can see a much more mandalized structure is there much more bone is there so that is the area you can go superior to the frontal sinus can engage the bone also okay ah. again the front where I, we have done actually the opening on the one side of the cranial of the skull so you can see that's a frontal sinus is there between the two frontal sinus actually there is a septum is there the highly uh, good mandalized bone is there that's how actually if the path you want to create a path the what is the path of insertion will be there so you can say you need to start from the imaginary palette that is available but it has this uh, uh, always you have to start from the posteriorly towards the anteriorly okay this is what i want to tell you you cannot go in a straight line if you go in a straight line as a straight path you are there high chance are there you're going to slip posterior to the cranial cavity and the glabular side again i want to specify the glabular area the glabular side which is highly mineralized is only in the anterior aspect with the fusion of the frontal and the nasal bone is there our aim and object is as you know it is like we need to limit the treatment we do to as atrophic as possible like a flapless techniques i'm doing always flapless flapless and we if we are doing a uh, if you're restoring the anterior defect or if you're restoring the nasal defect so you give me providing epistasis so you have to be act like an anaplastologist means you are actually providing the extra and intraoral prosthesis we do immediate function loading implantology whenever possible and we do a single piece implant because we don't need any micro gap junction we are engaging the buttress engagements we have four distribution is are there in the line of buttresses as you see we need this is tripodation it's so important that tripodation the concept was given by burke in 1980 Tripodation means that if you have two glabla, one glabla, two zygoma is there, it's a perfect tripod is there and it's the best thing to resist the lateral forces rather than having a, the quad zygoma actually and in anterior there is no implant is there and there will be too much flexion will be there. And we follow the orthopedic principles. We are doing a smooth surface implantology because the soft tissue really loves the soft, uh, the smooth surface titanium. And uh, if we go actually with the sinus man means uh, i'm not talking about right now the maxi sinus if we can to go if we perforate actually the frontal sinus also uh, there's a direct attachment will be there of the membrane to the to titanium surface is not a problem at all there is a smooth surfaces there so we are not thinking about the peri implant that is we should have a bendability because the abutment is actually more posterior inside then the bend then we have to bend the implant anteriorly to give a desired prosthetic results 
and we are doing always sprinting sprinting is a well known actually protocol by given by karakmanov meredith brunsky that the sprinting is necessary to do the image function loading in plantology and we our aim is to give a most convenient prosthetic design okay that has that can be fabricated just to the in your city or just in your clinic or just next to your clinic that can be done and we have want to have minimal pontic span our aim is so the technique if you if you want to place a glabella implant the later cephaloma has to be done anterior posterior cephalometry has to be done facial ct scan to be done supraorbital so nerve block infraorbital nerve block this is all actually uh, the thing has to be done and you should carry the nasal packs also sometimes the if the nasal bleeding is there so nasal packs are very very important at to to control the immediate complication so these are actually the drills are there as you can see the pathfinders the 2 millimeter drill is there and the uh, the the zygomatic drill is also there that is 2.2 meter and we have a adapter and the hand grip is there sharing a case one actually the first case orofacial rehabilitant this case was done in 2019 and is the first case ever where a implant the zygomatic implant has been done in the glabella in ever actually has been done it we were we are we, and i am proud to say that we are the person we did it for the first time in 2019 and this article also got published orofacial rehabilitation patient after inferior mastectomy rhinotomy with mono framework construction fixed intraoral process and nasal epistheson or zygomatic implant placed in the glabella nasion and floral frontal sinus so this was the article also got published so this like our uh, my my young colleague and a very good oromaxofacial surgeon dr perumal dr perumal has done the anterior mastectomy of this patient along with the rhinotomy and he has pectoral major flap he has mobilized all through the maxilla so that was the defect was there do we need to we need to cover up the, and he has given the bipedical flap to make actually the uh, the floor of the nose actually and to cover up the 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 uh, facial aspect so how we have so this is the condition what we were having actually the defect in the renal cavity uh, renal the nasal defect was there this is also the defect is there as you can opg that's a little cephalogram is there that's a ct is there as you see the defect is there so what how we started first of all we have to do the debulking of the procedure because we have to prepare the prosthetic bed and this is actually too much of the bulk was there because of the flap that got mobilized till to the maxilla so aim of objective was it's a we need to have a one step approach we need to do intraoral fixed process our aim was and to give extra oral removal processes we need to create a tripod addition is maxilla and we want to have a flap place want to do the flap place we need to create a anti nasal spine for the prosthesis means where the future process will lie utilization of zygomatic implant bodies bar retention processes i am going to explain and as i told you this all the thing so that was the concept what we want to do it so first of all we did the debulking after 6 weeks of the debulking that is a prosthetic bed was there so after giving a infraorbital and supraorbital nerve blocks we did this this is actually how we did the osteotomy of the patient we placed the implant we bended the implant anteriorly then the zygomatic implant we did do you see actually the incision incision was actually because we need to release the uh, flap also because the limited mouth opening was there so we have to give the incision Place the zygomatic implant, pterygoid implant, done. Flapless zygomatic implant at side, so that's a glabella is there. Anterior and the lower actually we need to because we always treat the case as a whole. So lower they were the missing teeth were there on the left hand side. So we we did the placement of the implant. There's a metal framework was there. That now in this patient because there was a limited uh, the the tissue the the uh, the upper lip was or the limited tissue was available at the upper lip so we have completed all through and through case actually in the in the cross bite situation so upper anterior teeth were in a cross bite to the to the lower anterior this actually what we did it that's a concept that the ct now we had a defect so how to complete the first so i came up with an idea and i am so grateful dr fazul rahman from chennai actually a very good prosthodontist and a very senior uh uh, uh, uh oro facial prosto uh, prosthetic work he does so i gave an idea why not to actually we need to have a bar of the zygomatic implant body of the zygomatic zygomatic implant to be used as a bar so we bar to and to have a retentive clips over it 
so that was the cavity was there so what we did we made a sleeve over the body of the implant and then actually we have cut down in the two part and the nasal apesthesis the part has gone inside at the tissue part so the clip has been formed and such a simple solution we have created so as you see actually our aim is to provide a simplest solution and to treat the patient least traumatically mm -hmm. So that was the case and one year post-op, the article already got posted, now it's a two year post-op is already done. Okay. Mm -hmm. Case two is, now as you see the first case we did it actually there was a ranectomy was also being done. But here actually when I'm talking about the case two, in case two actually we have the intact, the nasal cavity was there, the intact, intact, intact nose was there. But of course actually like as I see of the stage one of the secondary cutaneous mycormycosis, there all the turbinates and everything has been removed. This is, so we are having a crate, we are having a part to place a glabella implant. So this is the first time ever flap test glabella implant, zygomate fixture, nose and its content intact along with triple pterygoids, double zygoma bilateral we did it, tripodization achieved implant retentive and obturator delivered. So that's a mycormycosis was there, affected, you can see the bone, how the bone is there. So this is the glabella implant bilateral. Uh, zygomatic implant already done but later on I have removed the left side both the zygomatic implant because I know actually it was uh, means it can create a delayed complication because the the content of the bone is very very low hmm. so that's a glabella implant we did it you see the glabella implant the zygomatic implants on left and right and that's a triple pterygoid you see okay hmm. So that's the intro picture. You see the glabella implant, triple pterygoid, double zygoma. So this is actually the what obturator we have provided. Now case 3, as you see, that is a defect is there, very low mineralized bone is there, the right hand side the good glabula, the zygoma you are getting actually, but left hand side was a very very compromised bone is there as you can see, and just see the compromised bone on the left hand side, the zygomatic bone, practically there is no zygomatic bone at all, so as you see the situation, the picture. So there was no zygoma, so I did the double pterygoid on the left hand side, one glabella implant, right hand side, triple pterygoid and a double zygoma. Of course, it's all flapless. As you see, there's a triple pterygoid is there, double zygoma. That was a picture, framework, and there's the final process. Of the removal always is here, having a fixed metal framework is there, over the removal obturator is there. In another case, as you can see, you can see actually the how the compromised zygoma uh, the zygoma is available but we i was able to manage the triple pterygoid on the left hand side double zygoma bilaterally and the double pterygoids on the left hand side of course one glabella okay so that's a glabella implant you can see see that's a glabella implant that's a framework that's a obturator as you see so you are going to see the difference of how the patient is going to speak without the obturator and with the obturator.
ಪರವಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಊಟ ಎಲ್ಲ ಮಾಡ್ಬೋದು ಊಟ ಮಾಡ್ಬೋದು ಮಾತಾಡ್ಬೋದು ಮಾತಾಡಕ್ಕೆ ಏನ್ ತೊಂದ್ರೆ ಇಲ್ಲ ಇಷ್ಟು ಸರ್ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಇದ್ರಲ್ಲಿ ಯಾಕೆ So as you see actually how the, how the objector was there and like within two days we have completed the, uh, the pro- along with the process the implant placement immediate loading we did it and how the lifestyle of a patient changes you know mm-hmm. now there are more cases are there we did up till now I have done the 10 glabla cases I have already done it and one of the micro micro special I have done it today also like um, right now in a surat in morning actually I have done it the one more rehabilitation of the of the micro micro patient and tomorrow one more patient is waiting for us so you can see there was the part of the uh, the implant the bone was available and that the the zygomatic process was available so we engage the zygomatic process in the left hand in the right hand side the glabella is there triple pterygoid is there okay uh, that's a case 6 again double pterygoid one single zyg- uh, double uh, double zygoma pterygoids glabella implant as you can see yes as you notice actually my glabella implant is coming more towards actually the right hand side why is the emergence is there because i know that quality of the bone was very low on the right hand side of the zygomatic bone so i made intentionally i placed my implant from the right hand side so that i am good because there is only one zygoma implant is available at the right hand side the very poorly mundized bone so i want to minimize the pontic span at that area again one more case as you see it's all flapless okay this all flapless you can see how the bone content is there okay hmm. you can see the bone content of the right hand side so these are the cases are there after doing the splinting i all i now suggest actually because i suggest so we should not be giving a immediate functional loading splint the implants and give the prosthesis this process should be given just only for the for to talk actually uh, and otherwise uh, for not for masticatory function because this bone needs at least four to six months to get mineralized okay we have to give a soft loading case eight again one more case is there as you can see all has become the routine now case nine again you can see case 10 recently done case just uh, three or four days back then one more thing uh, like in 2017 we were the person we did actually one more uh, patient who had a mucor mycosis was there we rehabilitated and it's already got published so there today if i'm going to have this case i am going to do the glabella implant but that time i didn't know any glabella implant so this case we did it and from that day we came to know how poorly the mineralized bone is there so that is the case is there with follow up hmm. now this one more case is there as we are talking about the glabella is always there we are placing glabella implant this was the case where the where the mucor mycosis has affected the glabella bone also or the frontal sinus so i was not able to do the glabella implant this this particular area we did a very perfect double zygoma sterigoids everything we did it but the entire pontic span was there and i right now i am facing a failure for this case for me if i am not able to do any implant in the anti of the glabella then i am not going to do the bile quad zygomas because i don't want to risk actually such patients because they already lost the bone so i don't want to risk such patients so this was the case but right now i am facing a failure because because of a flexion uh, anterior 
there was no glabella for this particular patient or bone so the flexion is created okay so precautions or take away points one center posterior scanner cavity five meter lateral is orbit direct towards asian your direction should be towards near asian do to differentiation when in contact with bone so how am i doing actually it's not like that blindly i'm moving with the drill and when the engine is or the aerotrain is running uh, this micro motor is running uh, running it's not like that whenever i am in my bird is in contact in with bone then only i start the engine okay and post anatomy is easy insertion talk it, the immediate or delayed loading depends upon the insertion talk if the insertion talk is very high for the glabella and bilateral zygomas you can really go into immediate loading with the with the prosthesis and patient can eat start eating but if the insertion talk is soft in either of the zygomatic implant glabella implant you have to have a high insertion talk which is very important so then what you should do actually we should tell the patient to have to use the process only actually for the so for the social uh, environment and for domestication later do it okay uh, just to wait for 4 to 6 months on but uh, my colleague a uh, very good oromax official son uh, dr prashant mohan is actually and he is now there in in bangalore in mazumdar uh, uh, the cancer institute in bangalore narayana hospital and he is doing some wonderful work actually he is providing he has made a protocol he is providing the hyperbaric hyperbaric oxygen therapy for such patients and the results are highly positive i can say just recently i operated one patient and one patient operated few months back so that patient didn't have the oxygen therapy this particular patient has hyper hyperbaric oxygen therapy and the quality of the bone is markedly improved markedly improved actually so dr prashant is doing such a wonderful job and i advise everyone like If post mucor mycosis patient should go on a hyperbaric hyperbaric oxygen therapy and patient should be well informed of the complications so thank you very much i am this is my email and this is my phone number thank you very much to be patient for my patient presentation i say actually if you want to do a glabella implant i say this glabella implant is right now it's like in a protocol stages there and it's it's a early protocol so uh this is not just like that today i want to do the glabella implant i always say when you have a uh, there is nil bone is available in the anterior maxilla and you want to and you want to avoid the flexion of the zygomatic implant then so that was the lecture by dr vivek gaur um uh, do we have your course sir available online sir he was there yes, two months ago yes. Yes, Good sir. Good morning, sir. I'm there, sir. Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, lecture, sir. Uh, yeah, we can see you now. We can see you now, uh, sir. We have kept all the question answering sensor uh, session in the for the panel discussion. So, will you be available at that time? Sir, right now, right now, we'll start operating the case. Right now, just land in Kolkata. I'm in the clinic, sir. So, okay. if it, uh, what time will be the panel discussion, sir? I will so, try sir, to. Sir, we do... have two more lectures. Uh, to uh, by one by Dr. Nihal, sir, and one by Dr. Gyan, sir. So after yes. that we will be starting the uh, question answer session and panel discussions. After after one and a half one and a half. Yeah, yes, approximately, or... approximately, yes. Okay, yes. Sir. I will, will be, be keeping in contact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we'll 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 keep in contact, sir. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that was lecture by Dr. Vivek Gaur, sir. A very enlightening one. Now we will move to our next presenter, Dr. Nehal, sir. Uh, just give you the few uh, small introduction regarding Dr. Nehal. so uh dr nihal is has done a fellowship in cleft and craniofacial surgery in 2007 he has also done fellowship in tmj arthroscopy from austria he has done residency in tmj arthroscopy and total joint replacement us in 2017 he is been felicitated by german cleft children aid society for operating 3000 plus cleft surgeries he has been felicitated by association of oral and maxillofacial surgeons of india for running and 220 kilometers for rishikesh to uttarakhand that was great one he is pioneer in tmj arthroscopy in india he is faculty in amrita tmj course since 2016 and uh, he has multiple national international paper presentations and he is also member of american society of tmj surgeons and apart from all this he is one of the pioneer surgeon who has done the excellent work in patient specific implant okay that is one completely new era he has which he has opened for all the implantologist in india so i'll hand over to you dr nihal sir 
Anvil Karasana. Thank you, uh, Gostub. Yeah. So it was a, a wonderful lecture by uh, Dr. Sankalp and Dr. Kaur. So I'll be talking on a rehabilitation of the abuse motor defect with the patient-specific implant. This is a very new uh, concept. In fact, it's not new. Uh, uh, we all know about the subperiosteal implant, but uh, and it, the implant dentist actually started with the subperiosteal implant. The only problem was that time was uh, the uh, the method where which uh, they used to make a subperiosteal. So I am not going to talk about the defect which is caused by the mucor because I already been uh, talked about by uh, Dr. Sankal. So. Uh, Rehabilitation of this patient is very challenging because of inadequate bone, loss of lip support, primarily closed defect. Most of this patient, when we do a, a mycormycosis, we have closed this defect primarily by uh, stretching either bilateral or uh, <coughs> buccal mucosa. So you can see here, there is a primarily closed defect. Uh, and because of this primary closed defect, most of the time what happens is the palate is get retracted because there is no palatal bone support. And since there is no maxillary bone, most of the patient will start uh, doing an overclosure of the mandible. And this makes the uh, rehabilitation of this patient very challenging in terms of prosthetic and surgical rehabilitation. So these are a few of the challenges uh, we have to take in consideration while uh, planning for the rehabilitation. This is a fibrous tissue. So if we try to incise this area, which we do in normal cases, there is high chance that it may not heal or it may create the oroventral communication. Then primarily closed buccal and palatal mucosa, there is no bone inside. So uh, opening up the entire in, uh, palate may cause again oroventral communication and adherence of the palatal mucosa to nasal and sinus mucosa. So dissection of this area is very difficult because of adherence because there is no palatal bone. And since... Uh, is a primary closed defect, the uh, uh, buccal mucosa and palatal mucosa. The buccal mucosa actually stretch so that you can directly palpate the zygoma in this region. So this is a one of the CT scan as I have already seen that this, of the, this is the defect which is created. Sometimes you, you may see a zygoma which is absent or maybe there is a nasal bone which is absent. So the primarily, Primarily, uh, sometimes when uh, when you do a maxillectomy for the mucor, you may have to scratch the zygoma from the inside, which leaves uh, the bone hollow, or maybe there is no cancellous bone. So, what is required for a patient-specific implant is a good cortical bone for the mechanical retention. Now, when you plan the patient-specific implant. Uh, you need to understand this concept of uh, virtual planning because in virtual planning you can you can create an n number of designs you can create an n number of design you can you can put a, a titanium or the design on the uh, cranial cavity you can put on a nasal bone you can, but that has to convert in a clinical scenario so where where is the problem in converting that is clinical scenario is a soft tissue consideration because when we plan the patient with the implant Instead of planning according to bone, you have to plan according to soft tissue. You have to see the soft tissue cover first, then you plan the patient's implant so that in long run, you don't get any soft tissue problem. Like most of the time, what happens is when you fix the implant, the soft tissue give up over a period of time. That is because the implant design is not compatible or not in consideration with the soft tissue. So that is the reason we actually, uh, <clears throat> and it is not just the maxilla. Sometimes you get the defect in the ma mandible also where the defect of the mandible is different than the uh, normal resection defect because in the mandible, the mucormycosis usually spread to the medullary cavity. So when you remove the bone or the medulla, the defect you get is like this. There is no attached uh, uh, gingiva. The myeloid or the lingual surface of the ridge is directly attached to the top of the bone. And you said you see the crater set defect like this because there is no medullary cavity. So most of these muscles are attached here. So this is the thing you have to take in consideration while designing your PSI. So this is a mandibular defect where you can see there is a complete pitch inside 
the lingual bone is slightly higher. Most of the musculature on the lingual side are attached at the edge of the lingual surface. And this is the buccal side, which is lower than the uh, lingual side. So what is the rehabilitation? This is the rehabilitation goal for any of the meager case. To establish a normal function, to reduce the morbidity, to reduce the time. Then most important, long-term sustainability. The implant should be such that it should remain or sustain for a long time. Then aesthetically, you should give an implant which can create a lip support and replacement of the lost volume of the bone. The minimal rehabilitation time, reduced soft tissue exposure, which is important while, when actually you are planning for the uh, PSI. And it should withstand the day-to-day -day fighting forces. So considering all this thing, you need to create an implant which can at least give uh, stability with minimal morbidity and which can withstand the day-to-day -day, uh, biting force. There are traditional metals. Dr. Sangab already spoke about the zygoma implant and it has a long-standing uh, uh, results. I mean, as he said, there's seven years of uh, uh, results which are uh, there. Uh, and he already spoke about the uh, shortcoming of the zygoma implant where the bone is scratched inside, where the, the volume of the zygoma is less. It is difficult to place a zygoma implant. The second most conventional method is a, a, a placement of the free fibula uh, or maybe free graft. I think Jan is already speaking on that. And the most, I mean, it has an advantage of replacing a navy bone with the volume. I mean, you are replacing the volume of the bone with the bone, which is actually, which is one of the goal when you rehabilitate this patient. The only thing is, uh, uh, the prosthetic time may get longer. I mean, you place the bone then. So what I'm going to speak is not actually an alternative. It is basically, a, a, I mean, it is more of a extension of the science which has already been established. And you have to choose the method to treat this patient. It is not that the PSI or zygoma or cleaver is the only thing which have to be done or maybe a glabella implant. So you have to combine all of this thing and give a patient a better functional result. So till now we have done almost 12 meter patients and uh, either they had undergone a partial or total maxillectomy from April uh, 2020 to October uh, in the first wave. They have not yet started doing a second wave cases because they have not finished almost eight to nine months. Maybe uh, last couple of weeks we have started doing it. Uh, the primary requirement is six month post maxillectomy for the healthy bone, and there is, should not be any uh, residual defect on uh, radiology. And till now, we have done only in the patient where there is a primary closed defect. Uh, we will be doing, since we have now eight months of follow up, we will be starting doing this on a patient where there is a defect, we are giving a different design or the obstetric design. <clears throat> And the patient who had a six month or less so maxillary tommy defect, we actually did not do. So the second row of the patient, we are still waiting. And still we are uh, in a process of designing the uh, ESI for the patient who has over nasal communication. So these are, so uh, what is the method? The prime requirement is high grade CT scan. Uh, the design cannot be done on the CBCT. You need a very, high grade uh, medical grade CTCD. Uh, uh, the designing is in consideration with the uh, surgical and prosthetic technicality. High grade titanium 5, TI6, AI4, and VALI is used for the uh, custom, uh, fabrication, the uh, 3D printing of this design. And prosthetic is milled in PMMA. So the idea is this is a single stage procedure where patient needs to just get the CT scan and the lower, in, uh, lower impression, including the uh, occlusion, vertical, I mean, VD, everything is decided on the digitally. So patient needs to give impression and uh, uh, design only once. And when they come, uh, the entire procedure is done in a single setting, including the placement of the implant and the fixation of the prosthesis, so which reduce actually the entire overall time of the fixation, taking impression, and then uh, uh, fabrication of the prosthesis. So these are technical, uh, the design is uh, 
the implant is actually designed keeping in mind both the surgical and uh, uh, prosthetic uh, technicality. So it is basically a two piece design so that you can reduce the exposure. You can put a two small inches and directly on the zygoma and place uh, fix the implant. Uh, it is a wide base implant to cover the entire bone of the zygoma for the optimal mechanical stability. PT. The <clears throat> Extension on the uh, lateral orbital wall for the mechanical advantage, where you can put actually a large diameter 13 or large length uh, 13 or 15 millimeters group. And is, uh, the bar length, which is coming from the implant, is kept optimally so that it does not impinge on a soft tissue, but it can give a self cleaning area. And the angulation of the bar is designed in a such a way so that when patient chew, it distributes the biting force over the wider area of the implant. And there is a small anchor point which is given at the zygoma, which helps in the initial stability. Now, the primary concern in this all uh, PSI is the uh, adaptation of the implant to the bone. If your implant is not adapted snugly to the bone, and if you keep a void inside between the bone and the implant, there are high chances that over a period of time under the biting force, the implant may start loosening up or may uh, cause a stress fracture. So uh, to achieve that primary stability or the adaptation, the small anchor point was given. So during the uh, initial fixation, you, it, it, it actually guides the, for the fixation of the implant. <clears throat> so this is a basic design. There are two piece design, uh, one on each side. And uh, there's a multi-unit abutment is given at the bar. The is a prostate condensation. The threading is given in each and every uh, uh, cylinder to accommodate the OT equator bridge. Uh, and the placement of the abutments are corresponding to the canine and molar region for the maximum functionality. As Dr. Gaur and Dr. Santab also said, it is required to place a you know, enter implant to reduce the uh, stress on the anterior region. Then bar supported screw retain prosthesis for uh, distribution of the force on the wider area and uh, self-cleaning area or the prosthesis for the proper oral hygiene. And every, every abutment has been given a stress breaker so that when the patient chew, it distribute the force equally on the all the four uh, uh, stud. So this is the bar and this is the final process. Everything is generated digitally. So there are, uh, as Dr. Sankal already mentioned, there are uh, different type of defect which usually create. So this is another design where uh, the right side of the, actually uh, right side of the zygoma is given a, a conventional or what we usually do. And on the left side, we had extended actually the design over the zygomatic arch because lake of uh, zygomatic bone and on the lateral orbital room to accommodate the uh, high density cortical bone. Now in this case is, the cases like this, you may require to place extra oral incision. I think I, I'll be showing it in the couple of sides. And this is a unilateral case. Uh, the design is again different, and now this is away from the midline. So when, when it is crossing the midline, when it is near the midline, it is not possible to give this start and take advantage of uh, the cortical of the pyriform rim and the rim. So here the design is given so that you can just place this implant uh, with the small uh, vestibular incision rather than touching the attached gingiva which is present on the existing tooth. And the bar actually remains above the attached gingiva. So, so this is a, a unital design. And when it is not, or it is near the midline. Now, this is the most difficult design actually till now we have uh, faced because uh, if you give on the one side, it creates the cantilever on the in the midline. So, what we have done is the the bar which is coming on the outside has been connected from the opposite, this is just for the support. There is no, uh, there's no role of this side. And the design is given in a way that this can be placed just with the simple vestibular incision, small incision, so small incision on this side and direct incision on this side, and you can place this implant. So uh, now coming to the, the surgical step, 
as you can see, when you uh, stretch the uh, vestibule, well, you, you have to identify actually the parotid duct and your incision should be away, otherwise you may damage the parotid duct. Very small incision, uh, maybe 1.52 centimeter, directly on the zygoma, keeping the cuff for the suturing. And you have to undermine the zygoma, keeping the undersurface of the zygoma in, intact so that you are not actually exposing the, any uh, mucosal lining, neither the sinus lining or the nasal lining. It's a one side, you actually undermine till the lateral orbital rim and on the posterior root of the zygoma. This can be done subperiosteally without any uh, problem. So you have to create a pocket for to accommodate the, the implant. This is a design, this is I have fixed outside. Now while placing the implant, you cannot place directly in the one piece. So what we do is one, we, we fix this on the right side first, left side first, and the bar is actually attached after placing the, the in, uh, PSI inside. Once you place the, the bar, you have to fix the prosthesis before actually fixing uh, the implant with the bone so that you can achieve a proper occlusion on table before you fix your PSI on the zygoma. So this is very critical step because when you put the patient on the occlusion, your both the side of the implant should adapt to the bone uh, without placement of the screw. If it is not adapted, if it is not adapted, then there is a problem in your design or maybe there is a problem while uh, manufacturing. So those implants, I would rather avoid to place if there is no adaptation while keep putting the patient in the occlusion. Once we uh, see that both the uh, both sides the implants are adapted properly, the first you you place the two screws, uh, longer screws on the either side. You recheck the occlusion again, recheck the occlusion again, and once you are satisfied. So what we do is after placing the two screws, we pass a very thin probe or Mitchell over the edge of the implant and the bone to see if there is any space left between the bone and implant. If there is a space left, if we feel there is a space is left, then you may have to uh, remove the screw and then again recheck, uh, readapt and recheck the occlusion and adapt properly. So now you fix it. So it is more of, so when you make an implant during the designing time, you come from basically uh, occlusal to above. And when you place the implant, your sequence is reverse. You place an implant, fix the bar, put the processes, put the patient in occlusion, and then you uh, fix the uh, PSI. So this is a fixed bar. You can see there is a small incision and the entire, the middle part is intact, palate is intact. Once it is done, either you can, uh, if you have a buccal pad of fat, you can place actually buccal pad of fat as an additional layer of uh, uh, safety and then you close it primarily. Uh, sometimes we use a mucograft around this uh, implant uh, just to create a thick tissue like a gingiva and then you close it primarily. So now your only visible surface is a two stars or four stars of implant in the bar. And then you can fix the prosthesis with the screw. So this is the uh, prosthesis you get. You can see here there's a good self-cleaning area and patient can use a water jet for uh, cleaning this area. And uh, uh, so this is a unilateral case where a unilateral case, uh, Sometimes it is difficult because you have only one stud over. You can see here, the incision is given away from actually, uh, away from the attached gingiva directly or the vestibule, normal vestibular incision, very small vestibular incision. Second incision is on the zygoma. There is, a, there is no communication between these two incisions. And then the bar is fixed. Again, the process is, this is an on-table occlusion of the patient. You can see the midline and the uh, occlusion. So now the mandibular design, the design of the mandible is most critical because of the soft tissue consideration. Most of the time what happens is the mandible, uh, the soft tissue, because of the presence of the muscle on the lingual side, it gives away. So you have to plan your design in a way that your implant abutment, the abutment should only remain above the bone surface. 
if you keep your metal above the bone surface, there are high chance that that area may get exposed. And we have faced that problem actually. So it is important to cut the bone so that the only abutment remains. So this is a cutting guide which is created before actually applying the implant. And if you can see here, the actual implant has been placed below, keeping the two, uh, I mean, the bone in between so that both the lingual and the buccal, uh, buccal side are, is on the same level. At the same time, when you fix the implant, the implant actually only abutment remains above the bone. Entire assembly of the implant goes below the bone, I mean the remaining bone. And only the, so this is, this is the design. Now, this is very technical design in the term of, uh, uh, I mean, the attachment of the soft tissue. If you can see here, on the lingual side, there's no extension given beyond the uh, lingual bone. The one millimeter of bone is left on the lingual side of the cortex. That is because if you give a lingual extension in this area, because of the attachment of this uh, muscle, there are high chances that this area may get exposed. So now the problem in this implant is how do you actually fix it? If you just fix on the, this surface, if you just fix on the buccal surface, then it may create the fulcrum and there are high chances that it may get fracture here. So what we have done is we have created the abutment where the screws actually engage the lower border of the uh, mandible directly before fixation of the abutment. So there are two types of threading given in this abutment. One is in this cylinder just here at the base of the abutment and it, the, the head is actually replicated as a two millimeter. So it can occupy the, any uh, locking screw and another threading is given at this level to accommodate the abutment. So when you fix this implant, you have to fix in this side and then you have to put a 13 millimeter screw directly from this engaging the lower border. This creates a tripod uh, stabilization of this entire assembly and that leaves the lingual side of the mandible uh, intact, I mean the bone where the muscles can get attached. So, <clears throat> This is the design, you can see this abutment, you can't see the screw. This is an exposure only on the two side, keeping again the mucosa. Uh, since there is a ditch created at the, uh, because of the uh, mucormycosis, you have to give uh, something which can actually go below this. So this is a cutting guide. And after cutting guide, you have to remove precisely the same amount of bone so to create uh, the depth to accommodate the implant. So you can see here, once the implant is fixed in this region, the entire assembly actually goes below the bone, below the bone level. Only the abutment part remains above. So now this is actually the screw uh, engaging. You can see here, there is a 13 millimeter uh, 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 locking screw, which has been fixed from the actually start engaging the lower border of the mandible. And if you see this adaptation, there is no actually void, there is no uh, uh, gap between the uh, implant and the bone. Even the bar connecting the implant and the abutment also is adapted in the level of the bone. So this is the screw which is engaging the lower border. Uh, and once you fix that, you have to, fix the abutment, multi-unit abutment on the top of that. And then you, so here you can see the, uh, the lingual side is not going beyond the bone. The, all the, all the attachment from the abutment to the uh, bar on the buccal side is below the bone. So that actually gives an environment for the soft tissue to attach on the bone between the abutment and it reduce, so this is the uh, actually on table, uh, you fix everything, you fix the bar, and then you fix the processes. In this case, actually, we did not take upper impression. So there was initial discrepancy in the occlusion, which was actually rectified later on, on the chair side. <clears throat> so uh, every patient has an undergone CT scan after 48 hours. And every 15, 13, 45, and 90 days, we did a follow-up for the any days and inspection, loosening of the processes, heating efficiency and aesthetic. The usual follow-up right now we have is one to eight months. And three patients actually we removed the process to see how is the condition below the mucosa. And 
the zygoma implant the finet element analysis is going to compare the force which has been uh, transmitted to this implant to the zygoma conventional zygoma which has actually a long standing result so what the result shows is that the the force which has been coming on the conventional zygoma if it is placed in the ideal condition then it is around uh, 798 newton and the psi gives around 799 so it is equal force the bending force i am talking about not the breaking the breaking force for both the implant is beyond 1000 newton so bending force is around 794 about 90 for both which is way above the normal chewing which is way above the normal chewing force which has been given by the patient so now you ha you have to convince this patient that this is like a prosthetic so if you cut your leg and if you put a prosthetic you cannot run with that leg same way when when we are doing something uh, prosthetically rehabilitating you you cannot break a almond with your prosthetic teeth it is for the normal function normal chewing normal eating you can have a normal diet but if you give eccentric movement any implant is going to fail so this is six month post op you can see there is a nice uh, uh, mucosal healing since it is a polished collar it's a nice mucosal healing and this is the occlusion we achieved uh, six month post op this is the second case again good healing around the uh, implant stud there is good space above the uh, 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 prosthetic for the self cleaning and intact palatal mucosa this is a unilateral case and this is a mandible case this is a one month post operative where you can see just small amount of implant stud same as your conventional implant is coming out of soft tissue without any soft tissue inflammation and this is six month post op of the mandible there is no actually uh, dehiscence or no uh, 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 infection present this is a mandibular what i was talking you can see here the screw which is coming from the abutment is directly engaging or touching So this has all been designed digitally. So the land of the screw also is actually uh, decided pre-operatively that this abutment will uh, receive this number, of, uh, this length of screw. So you can see it is engaging the lower cortex without actually coming out of the uh, lower border. Same way here, it is engaging the lower cortex without any coming out of the lower. That is because of the digital planning. Uh, every every screw has been decided. Uh, pre surgically the length of the screw so that it does not actually go beyond the inner cortex of the bone including lateral orbital rim zygoma intraorbital rim or zygomatic arch to avoid any soft tissue so now still this is a emerging uh, technology or maybe in nlp emerging science we have to learn a lot of thing here uh, it is a good uh, alternative to the conventional way in indicated cases Uh, subperitoneal implant has a long standing uh, uh, history but it has fallen out of the use the only uh, because uh, in those days there are two stage method where they used to expose the area take an impression uh, make the cast and send for the fabrication in the lab uh, and second stage involved the 15 days post op you open only problem is the uh, adaptation of the implant to the bone which was not very precise because uh, you cannot actually regenerate uh, replicate the same thing on the cast now this three piece design reduce actually the exposure uh, patient you, you can discharge the patient you can do in a day care pr procedure uh, all the screws including zygoma we place with the trocar there is no extra oral incision is given in a single patient except for uh, the case where uh, there was extension on the uh, uh, la zygomatic arch uh so uh then the established techniques are used for the prosthetic relation in the psi is ot quater bar and the uh, ultimate abutment but still it is in emerging phase and we have to understand that while digitally you can create anything you have to convert those things clinically so how is it possible to convert clinically you have to create those designs and there are limitations we had a problem we had a problem with the screw fractures in certain cases because the initial cases the the diameter of the screw which was given and the threading was almost equal so while placing the screw uh, we had a three or four uh, screw head fractures uh, one patient 
three two patient there was a prosthetic loosening because they were bruxer and uh, one patient broke the prosthetic two times because of the clenching habit and ultimately we had to replace it with the uh, ceramic uh, there was no actually the prost uh, surgical complication i mean one patient we had actually uh, infection which was taken care of just with the uh, irrigation and the debridement <coughs> uh and uh, one patient actually we, there was a broken screw in the prosthetic the, the all the complications were managed chair side because already it was fixed uh, the implant was fixed we are still waiting for the one year result where i can take actually the ct scan of uh, uh, this patient and compare it the bone resorption underside of the uh, the plate which has been given Uh, professor morris has a long standing uh, 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 case series of almost 25 years of this patient and he has done extensive work according to him if if the implant is prone considering the soft tissue the, the chances of success are increased tremendously so so when you plan psi you have to plan prosthetically and considering the soft tissue in your mind since we have a low follow up period i think i will still i would still wait for, for uh, another one and a half two years for directly jumping and doing a psi surgically it is very technical because the technically involved uh, exposure of the uh, uh, zygoma but it may serve as a valid alternative for the post mucormycosis uh, uh, resection cases because it's a single stage procedure the rehabilitation is very fast less morbid and uh, uh, the the number of visit for the patient is reduced thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you neil sir and uh, <clears throat> we will take all the question and answer in the panel discussion sir now we'll move to our next lecture that is by uh okay nice so good all the participants can also see our next presenter is dr gyanendra mishra he is a fellow international board for oms he has done kls martin fellowship by IAOMS in head and neck oncology and microvascular reconstruction he has done fellowship in cleft and craniofacial surgery at GCCRI and he is a fellow in head and neck oncology at Shelby Hospital Ahmedabad he has worked as he has done his post graduation from MS Ramayya and he has a special interest in exclusive head and neck onco reconstruction and complete rehabilitation okay and he has done recently he has done very few good cases we had also privilege to work with him in one case for the fibular reconstruction using the fibular reconstruction for the maxilla so now i hand over the uh, podium to the dr gyanendra mishra i hope he's online dr gyan can you hear me yes i can hear you okay, please switch on your video if possible nice okay thank you for the generous introduction my pleasure my pleasure so uh, Uh, good morning everybody and i'm thankful to the organizing committee for this uh, opportunity uh, uh, sir, sir you, you can share your you screen. can share your screen now just Take your time. Take your time. Not a problem, sir. Yeah. One come. Uh, while Dr. Gyan connects uh, his uh, screen, we I would like to tell all the participants that if you have any questions. to our uh, to our panelist please write down them in the chat room okay so that during panel discussion we can have the quest good and healthy question answer sensor session
Yeah. If you have any query, Dr. Gyan, you can ask me, not a problem. We can help you out. Initially, it was not asking for any permissions. Now it is asking for permission to join. Just click on it. We will we will grant from you. You are a co-host also with the meeting, so it will be done. Please bear with us while Dr. Gyan connects with us. Uh, meanwhile, if you have any questions, uh, we can utilize the time to start the question answer sensor with, with the Dr. Nihal and all the available panelists. Dr. Neil sir, are you there with us? Meanwhile, we um, <clears throat> to utilize the time, I would like to uh, introduce to our panel uh, utilizing this time. Uh, The panelist for our uh, panel will be Dr. Sankalp Mittal. Uh, then it will be Dr. Nehal Patel, Dr. Haran Pandya sir, Dr. Kiran Patel, Dr. Gunjan Shah, and Dr. Kausik Pethani. They will be all joining us online once we have uh, the last lecture finished. Uh, to give the small introduction regarding other panelists, uh, Dr. Haran Pandya is a uh, professor at uh, DDIT Dental College, and uh, he has a uh, very very uh, nice uh, experience in the, in the field of zygomatic implants, and also he has work in the conventional implants. He is also having a good hands-on experience <laughs> regarding the simple piece implants. implants. Uh, Dr. Kiran Patel is, as we all know, that he is the leading single piece implant or basal implantologist of Gujarat. And he will be enlightening us with all his experience and all our queries regarding the use of basal implants in the field of psychomatic, uh, in the field of the rehabilitation for the mucormycosis cases. Uh, Dr. Gunjan Shah is uh, having the uh, um, main interest in the field of oncosurgery and he is also having a good hands-on in the field of rehabilitation using the microvascular flaps in the form of radial forearm flap or of free fibula flap. So he will be uh, discussing or he will be answering our questions regarding the uh, use of the free flaps for the rehabilitation of the lost maxilla or mandible. Dr. Kaushik Pethani, uh, he is a, one of the prolific surgeons in the Saurashtra area, and he will be also sharing his experience regarding the uh, rehabilitation of the mucormycosis and his experience in that field. We are still waiting for Dr. Gyan to connect with us. Just give us a few minutes.
Kosto, is there any problem with the? Yeah, so Doctor Vimesh is uh, helping him out. There is okay. some problem with his connection. Okay. Yeah. We we'll wait for a few minutes. If it doesn't work, then we will start with the panel discussion. In that. It's done. Yeah. Yeah. There is a. Meanwhile, to utilize the time, if you have any panelist uh, <clears throat> available online, yeah, it's we have we have the connection with Dr. Gansa. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Welcome, sir. Welcome again. Uh, thank you. Sorry for the delay. <clears throat> yeah, no problem. You can so start. Good morning, now. everybody. So today we will be uh, talking about total maxillary reconstruction with free fibula graph in uh, post mucor mycosis cases. So the problem here is, as Dr. Nehal mentioned, the problem here is soft tissue loss. So we are basically doing this reconstruction in a type of cases who have loss of oroantral, loss of palatal tissues, and they basically suffer from problems of oroantral communication, oronasal communication. So uh, as Sir said, most of the cases are being closed primarily, but we saw a number of cases which were not even closed primarily, and there was loss of palatal soft tissue. Also, uh, in a number of cases, uh, bone along with maxilla total or radical maxilla with, uh, uh, with or without removal of zygomatic bone and infrabital rims were also removed. So uh, in both these cases, uh, in conventional methods of only implantology, were, we, we th thought that it was probably not suffice. And in a few cases where there were remaining bone was not healthy, in which, the, in which we thought probably uh, the bone cannot sustain so much of torque. So these were the basic cases in which we thought uh, reconstruction would better be with uh, like bone-like bones replacement. So what fibula does is it replaces the volume of the bone with bone. Uh, it also replaces bone in cases where there is loss of good cortical structures for implant placements. And it also brings a lot of tissues along with it so that uh, it helps the deficiency of tissues, which are either fibrous or not working or probably will not provide good bulk for the uh, mid phase. So the next question comes is why fibula? So fibula, as we know, fibula replaces uh, bone with bone. It has the uh, ability to bring, uh, bring along skin, muscle. So skin and muscle and bone, all three together. The muscle helps us to close and support the orbit and the orbital contents. The skin helps to separate the uh, oral cavity with the nasal cavity. And the bone forms the native alveolar process with replacement of uh, zygoma, which um, later helps in the placement of dental implants. So fibula also is a vascularized structure. So we are not worried about uh, the vascularity of the um, recipient site. It helps in restoration of the facial contours. It supports globes and orbital content, as we said, the muscle, the uh, peroneus uh, FHL, the flexor helicus longus muscle supports the uh, orbital content. 
it obliterates the dead space. So the very big problem of the volume loss during and after the mucor uh, resection surgeries is the volume loss, which causes depression in the mid face structures along with the loss of zygo zygomatic bone and the prominence is replaced by the volume which is which fibula brings along with it. So it is a thin and slender bone which comes in abundance, which can be helpful in placement of dental implants and its rehabilitation. It has a very low donor site morbidity and a two-team approach is possible. Now, because these surgeries are longer, we would always want some uh, donor site in which two teams are a two-team approach is possible. Now, as with any, any other surgeries, this surgery also has a, a lot of challenges. Uh, very few and uh, very first and the not most noticeable one is the long surgical time. So we usually take somewhere close to seven to nine hours for the uh, surgical uh, surgical completion of the procedure. And it is a, because it is a complex reconstruction of uh, the mid phase, it does need a good planning and a good team approach. The management of soft tissue and the management of bone along with the amount of the length of the pedicle required to reach the neck for anastomosis, they have to be balanced very well so that none of the one or the other is not deficient to either uh, a deficient bone or deficient, uh, deficiency in the vascular length so that the procedure is successful. Now, also because we are not giving any uh, incision on the uh, incision extra orally, all fixation is done intraoral. So it faces and poses a challenge for the fixation of the whole uh, reconstructed maxilla unilateral or bilateral uh, to the zygomatic bone and the processes. So uh, initially, the cost used to be uh, one of the few challenges for the long surgery and the long length of hospital stay. But now it gets covered in MediClaim, so that challenge is at least uh, taken care of. Now, in last six to eight months, as Nails have mentioned, mentioned, we are only being operated in the uh, patients after the first COVID cases, first COVID wave. So I have done close to 10, 11 cases by now. And uh, we have only started rehabilitating from last uh, two, two and a half months. So a few cases I'll discuss today. One uh, To start with, this is the case with um, a unilateral right side total radical maxillectomy with loss of infrabital rim and zygomatic bone with zygomatic uh, prominence and arch both were removed. We did a CT scan and we did a 3D uh, virtual surgery and virtual planning for the patient. And we came up with a plan that a five segment osteotomy in which one segment will be removed for the jumping distance. So we did a five segment osteotomy of which first and the second segment will form zygomatic arch and zygomatic prominence. And the third and the fourth segment will form the maxillary alveolar um, arch. So uh, this was the basic surgical plan. And so as you see here in the picture, it is very well labeled that one and two are forming zygomatic bone and three and four are forming the, um, the maxillary alveolar arches. Whereas the, you, you see the, the distance between the segments two and four is another bone segment which is being removed for uh, the pedicle to traverse between them. And the pedicle goes from posterior region towards the neck for the anastomosis. Now, usually in these surgical, uh, in these patients, the leg is positioned at 90 degree flexion position. And uh, primary, in, I usually only mark the primary incision to first locate the perforators. Once that is located, we mark our uh, we mark our skin pedal as it is required in the reconstruction. So once the perforator is located, I mark it permanently with a skin stapler or skin stapler or a suture so that it is not missed uh, post-operatively. So after the harvest is complete, we routinely get close to 15 to 17 centimeters of bone. Yes, that is right that we can uh, harvest up to 20 to 25 centimeters of bone in a taller individual. But all of the bone cannot be used for reconstruction because some part of the bone has to be separated from the pedicle, as you see in the picture, which travels through the neck or travels inside the neck, helping in the anastomosis. So essentially we are using close to 15 to 17 centimeters of bone, which is attached to the, uh, uh, which is attached to the pedicle. In this 15, 17, 17 centimeters of bone in for this patient, we did a five segment osteotomy of which the middle segment will not be used. So we are doing using a four segment. And uh, we, in this process, we also are able to get close to eight or 10 centimeters of pedicle length to travel through the neck. Now, once that is done, 
we will play the fibula and we will play the fibula as the as it was preoperatively designed all the plates are done and whole proce procedure is done while the bone is still attached to the uh, leg so this is only to ensure that till the end of the procedure it reduces the ischemia time that means the vessel the bone is still being vascularized during all this process and also we at the end of implant placement and at the end of all this fixation we would know that the every component of the flap is still bleeding i mean the bone the muscle and the skin all three components are still bleeding that means it is still viable there is no defect there is no damage to the pedicle so once that is done and confirmed this there is this is a short video just to show that the middle segment was removed so this middle segment is removed and the pedicle keeps traveling behind the fibula bone the uh, left side two segments are forming the zygomatic arch and the zygomatic prominence. The right side two segment will be forming the uh, maxillary alveolar ridge. And the rest of the uh, vessel will travel the neck. So once that is done, we will confirm the position. Uh, when, when we'll confirm the position of the maxilla and the zygomatic bone over to the uh, model which is being made. Once we confirm that all everything is in right place, we'll do the fixation intra. Um, we'll do the fixation and do the anastomosis. This is the post-operative OPG and the post-operative CT of the uh, patient. In this patient, we also use an orbital mesh to support the because the orbital floor was also removed. Now this is another patient in which bilateral total maxillectomy was done with the loss of soft palatal soft tissue. Now the basic complaint of this patient was that they were not, he was not even able to drink water. This was been for a long time. For seven to eight months, he was not able to do anything. We waited for another three to four months and then we started his reconstruction. So the basic aim into this reconstruction was to close this defect and bring new tissue so that the defect remains closed and we achieve uh, the mid facial prominence and facial contour along with it and also supply, supply bone for dental implants. So same thing, we did a planning again, virtual uh, planning, and we uh, came up with a plan of three segment osteotomy to reconstruct the bilateral total maxilla with muscle to close the nasal and oral tissues and skin uh, towards the oral cavity side. So in this virtual planning, we also got, we also usually get a, a cutting guide, fibula cutting guide and an implant placement guide, which you see as small circles over the fibula cutting guide, just to point out the uh, places where the implants can be placed. So one with all this uh, already ready in place, we do the pre-bending of the plates using a template or the 3D uh, model. The very good uh, use of this is if you do not do this, it is very difficult. It is extremely difficult to bend the plates. It also takes a lot of time. So to bend the plates and get a good adaptation, good, a good passive adaptation without this. So it actually helps a lot. So once that is done, we confirm the placement, placement of the plates over the uh, 3D model and fixation is done in, in the leg. So after that, uh, as guided by the implants, as guided by the surgical guides, implants are placed. In this case, in this case, we put five implants between the screws. So this is uh, the picture after the implant placement while the fibula is still attached to the leg. And we separated the fibula and it is ready to be fixed intraorally. So before we do that, we usually, as I said, we will again check it inside the model that if it is going to be fixed well, although while taking the picture, the implant has moved, uh, the whole thing has moved, but it was fitting right into the position passively. So we will already be uh, deciding how many number of screws we'll be putting. So once that is done, we fix the fibula intraorally uh, on both the zygomatic bones. So uh, after that, the final and the most important step of the anastomosis, in last cases, I did not show. So this, we usually use facial artery end to side, end to end, and internal jugular vein end to side anastomosis. And the vessel travels, it, you can take the vessel either lingually or buccally. I preferred lingually in this, in this patient. Now with all this planning and execution and uh, 
uh, all two team approach we still have problems now the problems which we faced after first two cases were orientation of the fibula now by orientation i mean in all three axes although the fixation was well seemingly well it still we still used to have a, a discrepancy either in a cant in the occlusal level i mean of the occlusal level of the fibula or increased or decreased vertical dimension or uh, or in the or a cant in anterior posterior position so to reduce that as nail sir mentioned in his talk we also started doing the same we started coming from bottoms up so uh, because there was no preoperative records uh, in all these patients which we have done there were no preoperative records so we had to arbitrarily find some preoperative records based on the lower impression and the scanning and we did that so for the first patient what i did was we just uh, arbitrarily developed a preoperative record of the maxilla fixed it to the mandible and uh, and the fibula was then fixed on to the arbitrary record which we then made once that was done the fibula was put on the uh, mandible and imf was placed and we then adapted it. Uh, then we passively adapted the plate over the zygoma to fix screws. And once that was done, the maxilla along with the fibula was taken intraorally, IMF, and fixation was done. So in following cases, we started doing. Uh, uh, we've started fabricating a denture with the help of prosthodontist. So he is arbitrarily fabricating uh, a denture, and the denture is used as a guide for implant placement. So we will, I, we will do the, uh, we'll fix, the, we'll, uh, we'll harvest the fibula, we'll osteotomize it, we'll use the implant, uh, we'll use the denture to pit, put implants and then fix the denture with the fibula, with either a cold cure or a uh, flowable composite, and then do the IMF intraorally to fix the plates. So this is only to show you the passive adaptation of the plates as we are holding it. So passive adaptation of the plates was the zygoma and denture in place. So as with any procedure, we also have a lot of uh, uh, contraindications in patients who are not generally fit for general anesthesia, as in poor performance state. So patients who have poor cardiac conditions, uh, poor respiratory conditions due to COVID, or renal problems who are where we cannot control the amount of fluid given or post-operative care. And patients who have been followed for less than six months uh, into the post-COVID into the post-COVID uh, treatment because there is so much of hardware which goes in, it will be very difficult for us to uh, follow up these patients for any recurrence or any other questionable disease progression. So, uh, a few disadvantages which we uh, find is which we find people will found uh, is going to be difficult is the long surgery and the long stay. So we usually, as I said, we take close to seven to nine hours and the length of hospital stay is close to five to seven days, including one day in ICU, <clears throat> which is just for monitoring. Donor site morbidity is although, however, less and it does not usually affect the quality of life, but it, there still is some donor site morbidity. And the biggest problem and this um, uh, scary moment is the chances of free flap failure. You know, however good I do or however good we, the team we have, there are still three to 5% chances of a free flap failure. And because these patients are basically coming to us only for reconstruction and rehabilitation, and all of this uh, patient will not get anything if the flap fails. So you will only be left with two choices. Either you can give them an option of a second, uh, second free flap or the, or the second fibula, or we'll have to uh, go back to some uh, local flaps or obturators then. So I still give options to our patients. If there's, if such a thing happens, I still give option to the patient of doing a second flap. So in past, in not mucor cases, but in past we have done two case, such cases in which primary fibula had failed, and we gave opportunity, we gave the discussion and opportunity to the patient. Patient took, uh, went for it, and we did second fibula, and successful and uh, fortunately it is successful. So I'm not saying all second will be successful, but the chances remains the same. So we have to bear in mind that although if it works, we get everything, but if it does not work in three to 5% of cases, we might not get uh, the result. So in all of these cases, a second procedure will be required in form of either debulking or in form of some uh, uncovering this uh, uh, implant screws, which can all be done in, on chair side. Now it is a technique sensitive. It has a long steep learning curve and there are the, it, it has to be done in a uh, 
a better surgical setup. It, the patient has to be monitored very closely. So all these are uh, adding to uh, the disadvantages. But because uh, in a surgical setup where we are already operating such things, it becomes easy and a part of daily routine. And as Nail sir said, the prosthetic phase is usually delayed. In all these 10 cases we have done uh, in post mucor uh, rehab, one, two or three are now under the rehabilitation process and rest will be started after three to six months. So, but I always believe that good things will always take time. So with time, I hope that these patients, none of these patients have any problems till now, but these patients will do well and we will be, we will have some problems, but we will have good results too. Thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present. A special thanks to the team, the surgical team who helps us do complete the process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gyan. It was a very enlightening one. And, uh, you know, it, when we have lots of soft tissue and uh, deficiencies, your approach makes a lot, yeah. lot, lot, lot more sense in some cases. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so now we'll start with the panel discussion. So I, I request all the panelists to uh, start, share uh, what I can say to unmute their videos, uh, unmute their audio and uh, start their videos. <coughs> uh, to introduce the panelists, uh, we have. Uh, uh, I would just like to inform that Dr. Shankar is right now uh, traveling, so he will not be available with us. And Dr. Kiran is also occupied with some uh, emergency meeting. So, panelists we have available is Dr. Uh, Patel sir, Dr. Gyan, uh, Dr. Harin Pandya sir, and uh, Dr. Gunjan Shah. And uh, well, I will be moderating the session. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So I hope uh, I am audible <coughs> properly, and all the panelists are online now. Uh, Dr. Kaushik, yeah, yes, yes, you have to unmute your videos. Yeah, unmute audio. Dr. Nihal, sir, is he available? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we have very, uh, very nice. Uh, presentations on all the different approaches which we can use for the rehabilitation of MIPR, starting from the conventional zygoma implants by Dr. Sankal Mittal to basal single piece implants by Dr. Vivek Gaur. And we also had a very nice presentation by Dr. Gyan regarding the use of uh, fibula and uh, obviously use of a new era like using a patient specific implants by Dr. Nihal. So, I have, while doing the moderation, I would like to uh, give a disclaimer that I have any limited experience with the free flaps or a PSI, but my experience is with the single piece implants and the conventional zygoma implants. But still, I would like to take all the, your opinions in the cases which we have done so far. So uh, the points to discuss for, for each and every case is to what kind of defect we have. Is it an open defect or a closed defect? Okay, is it having any kind of communication or not? What kind of incision, when we are doing the surgery, what kind of incision to be used? It has to be, it has to be a crystal incision or it has to be a parietal incision or we have to go buckle. What kind of? In cases of fistulas, do we really need a soft tissue grafting or we can just use a no graft approach by using the only prosthesis to close the communication? What are difficulties we uh, face when it is a, either a unilateral case or a bilateral case? In both the cases, the different, the, the different treatment approach has to be uh, kept in mind that the other side of the dentition might come into the picture which may cause problem or it, may, it can be helpful also okay same way as we had discussed earlier what kind of implant which we can use like it can be either two-piece zygoma or a conventional zygoma implant or it has to be a single piece zygoma 
or we or which we call as a basal implants or you can use the patient specific implants and one of the most important thing from the patient aspect is how to go for is, is it has to be an immediate loading or a delayed loading and what kind of prosthesis we should be choosing fixed or removable one That's so precise. i would like all the panelists to keep these points in mind while we are dis, uh, while we are having the discussion regarding the cases so with this i would like to start this one a uh, normal routine zygoma uh, routine mucor case i would say where we where now this kind of picture we normally see after the surgery once we have done the maxillectomy right i hope all the panelists agree we have nice close defects now normally we don't see this kind of picture when the patient has been operated by some other specialty like let's say ent surgeon or an onco surgeon normally they remove the soft tissues and now we have a open defect but normally what we have seen or what i have seen is that when the patient has been operated by an oral and maxillofacial surgeon we try to preserve the soft tissue okay so that we can have a good primary closure of the defect okay so once we have this kind of uh seen or what about this kind of uh, patient available with us and this patient comes to us post op okay now this patient needs some rehabilitation after 6 months so this is the pre op picture okay now i would like to take opinion uh, of dr harin sir yeah we have all the panelists available yeah okay sir what will be your pre operative planning in this cases like in this that okay starting from the first go what would you like to have harin sir am i audible yeah yeah you are audible sir am i audible yeah yes sir hello okay sir <clears throat> so uh, this would be a good uh, defect as in uh, what we have been working uh, together also in the team we have seen uh that uh, if we have soft tissue nothing like it uh, because it uh, solves many of our post operative problems in a very very effective way it is the first thing and second would be the volume of the bone that is available to us so as is evident we see thanks uh, zygomas here yeah. and so yeah, uh, depending upon the surgeon and the condition uh, we can prefer either of the either of the things for the rehabilitation Uh, be it a zygoma uh, or a PSI implant. As in going ahead for the planning, it is better that we uh, plan it with the help of uh, uh, software, if possible. Uh, as in the CBCD software, wherein uh, we can plan what kind of an implant where we uh, we can uh, put here, and it goes a long way because uh, this technology really enhances our vision. Of what would be the best, not only in terms of placement, but also in the processes that we might be able to provide uh, later on. So, so what what will be your choice of implant here? PSI or zygoma? Uh, or I really appreciate the work that uh, Dr. Nihal has done concerned of uh, mm. the PSI implants that has been used. uh but uh, given a choice if uh, good zygomas are available i would uh, still like to be a little bit uh, conventional and uh, try to uh, make zygomas as uh, so your voice is breaking if you can come near to the mic yeah so uh, given a choice i would uh, stay with the conventional uh, zygomas the time tested uh, one uh, uh, i really appreciate what uh, what neel has done as uh, concerns of the patient specific my first choice when the zygomas have a good volume would be okay so your first choice is or, psi uh, uh, yeah. as yeah. a situation yeah 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 dr kaushik oh, your your your, your your yeah uh as there is a good volume in the uh, zygomatic bone both the yes, sides yes. Uh, yeah. it is well mineralized i guess now after surgery so uh, for patient specific implants what i have observed is the prosthetic part is relatively easy so yes. you don't have to uh, you know struggle much in the prosthetic part as your process is ready at the time of surgery itself mm -hmm. so my first choice would be the psi but the disadvantage of psi is it has little higher cost than the zygoma yes yes you so we right. have to balance and uh, the whole mucor rehab uh, cases i guess is you need to balance between the plus and minus 
So yes. according to the patient's affordability, according to the given clinical and radiological analysis, we have to make choice. So if the cost is not a problem, then I, in this case, I would go for PSI. Okay. Second choice will be the zygoma. Okay. Okay. Before like, okay, that's fine. Got it. Any other specific investigation you would like to do in such cases before doing any kind of, before going for an implant surgery? What will be your uh, choice? Uh, what will be your protocol? Pre-op protocol in such cases? Yes. Uh, apart from the medical condition, which has to be ruled out for the general anesthesia or any kind of surgery, what we do the, is uh, pre-operative assessment. Secondly, uh, the bone volume or the CT density of the medullary part of zygoma is very important mm -hmm. if you are going for zygoma implants. Mm -hmm. And if uh, we choose to go for PSI, then the outer cortex or outer cortex at least is important. That yes. it gives a, a, a wider area where we can put the vertical screws in the body of zygoma. Good, good, good. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gyan, Yes, sir. Yeah. So in such kind of cases, my, what, uh, my question to you is that this is a nice close defect, if you can see here, right? Yeah. So do you think that such cases really need the, uh, uh, what I can say, the free fibula or any kind of reconstructive surgery or we are doing sufficient by doing just directly simply going for the implant placement? What is your take? Well, I'll always be biased. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will always be biased, but yes, Unless I would say I, I give a choice to the patient and the okay. only choice to the patient is if they, it's, they want to replace that bone. Okay. This is a, there is no loss of uh, any other structure other than the alveolar segment of. Uh, yes, yes, yes. The there, whole maxilla has gone, rest, all the bones are still there. Everything is fine. If you can yeah. get, deliver, if there is somebody who can deliver a good prosthesis, fixed prosthesis based on the implants, it is very okay. good first option. Okay. If the patient comes looking for it, I will not say no. Okay. See, we have had a few cases, two of these cases, where patients have come looking for, we need bone to replace, we need good volume of the uh, mid face to be replaced which probably would, did not get an answer. Probably he was not, uh, he did not go one, to one of you. But if patient comes looking for it in this patient, I will do. Otherwise we will give them the option. If you can get through uh, implants, it will be equally good. So, and the cost you. is also the same. So it does not matter. It is probably equal to what PSI, what they are giving as PSI. Good, good, good. Right. So uh, that's what uh, I would just go through with what we have done. So what we have done here that we had we planned this case, the patient is having as Dr. Kausik said that having the financial constraint, we had to choose for the minimal cost option. So we had gone for, chose for the quad zygoma. This is the virtual planning, which we did to approximately decide the length of the implants and the position of the implants. And this is the post-op OPG, which we have achieved here. Uh, we have got insufficient primary stability, but we didn't decide to go for the immediate loading. What we have decided that this is a mucor case, it's better to go for a delayed loading. So we didn't, we haven't gone for the prosthesis yet. This is the uh, recent post-op picture. Now my question to Nihal sir. Nihal sir, can you unmute please? Yeah. Yeah. Sir, can you see this uh, hanging uh, shafts here? Yes. Yeah. So as what we, what we have done that we, we what we did in this pre-op planning was we superimposed the pre-op mucor CBCT on the post maxillectomy defect so that we can approximately get the good length of the or uh, length of the zygoma implant which has the nice outcome at the palatal side like when the patient has the intact maxilla but now after the healing we have a long hanging shaft here. So can you give us any idea of what we should be doing this so that patient do not have the post of food lodgement there? So see, I'll, I'll answer your first question of my choice. <laughs> then I'll yeah, go sure. to this. Yeah. So first of all, I always, patient has to understand the limitation of uh, ESI. Yeah. So if patient is falling in an inclusion criteria, see it is like a, it's a new science. First of all, we do yes. not have a long-term result. Yeah. Second thing, there is a well-established method of zygoma or maybe the conventional repair of uh, what Jan is saying. 
Hmm. Third thing is uh, cost, as uh, Kausik has already said. And fourth thing is, uh, uh, if patient is willing to take a chance, it is like you have introduced a new EV, and if you want to take a chance, then I, if patient is falling in that criteria, I would definitely prefer for this case a PSI. Definitely. If not, if not, if patient is not willing to take chances, I always tell patient you may have to see. It is like giving a chance. If this fails, I have a chance to put a fibula. So I okay. explain to the patient that this is the thing. If you want to willing to take a chance and come in the study which we are doing, and this is a more technically we are designing. So if we have a trust, we do it. Otherwise, uh, there is more conventional way of zygoma. I have done myself a zygoma. I am not very good at because I saw your case and I could not get that parallelism what you are getting right now. So I mean that is the all uh, what we give to patient for this particular patient. The zygoma, I have a very uh, limited experience, but what we do in PSI is uh, yes. we superimpose a soft tissue also. So what yes. we do is we, we uh, apply a, a radiopaque gel on the palatal surface and okay. uh, then yes. you take a CT scan. Okay. And then again, you are actually superimposing the cast on the same thing. So yes. You get the exact palatal uh, uh, height of the uh, uh, palatal okay. height. Yeah. And then uh, when you decide the length of the zygoma, I think you may come over this problem of uh, expose, I mean, those long uh, uh, soft, uh, I mean, polyscular exposing inside. Yeah. Yeah. So, but so that uh, is but what we, we do actually. Yeah. So, so choose, why we chose for the long shank is that if we have chosen the shorter shank, the, what happens is that the multi-unit comes onto the buccal side then. Exactly, I know. Yeah, then then it becomes even more difficult to maintain. Here, yes. what our primary target was to get the access opening of the prosthesis onto the palatal aspect, so that patient uh, we can easily maintain the prosthesis while removing and insertion. So that was our that's why we chose for the longer implants. So the other, we, what? Yeah. So my question to you is that can we do anything right now to prevent this long chain coverage, you, you, or we should just actually, keep it like this? Uh, now you have to see this is a polyscolar as i said in my lecture patient has yeah. to understand patient has to see what is collection is there patient has to understand this is a prosthetic rehabilitation like any other part of the body you yes, cut yes. the leg you put a prosthetic but you cannot run with that so it is like they have to remove the leg every day or maybe someday to actually uh, release the uh, uh, tissue tension on the knee the same way when they remove you have to clean it unless and until you clean it the soft tissue is going to give away so this yes. is what from our side, we have to explain to the patient this is not the natural rehabilitation. This is a prosthetic, you have to take care. So maybe I don't think there should be a problem in this long. I have one patient where PSI also is initial cases. First two cases where we have the long PSI stud which is coming outside. So they are not yes. creating a problem. No. Do the patient complain of uh, ulceration or irritation of that so this free mucosa here in this part? Hello. Yeah. Can you repeat? Can you repeat yeah. this? So, do the patient complain of irritation into the buccal mucosa part because of that? No. See, the the entire concept of PSI is everything okay. is being okay. studied preoperatively. So, including the uh, placement of the abutment, including the height of the abutment and the height of the prosthetic bar also. So, most of the time, the fabrication is done in a way so when you place and if it is adapted properly, none of the soft tissue as far as uh, uh, soft tissue away from the bar, it doesn't actually has any problem since eight months, last eight months. One patient, as I said, because of the uh, screw loosening, he had a swelling, uh, two patients in fact, but that was because of the prosthetic movement rather than the actual implant movement. Otherwise, in intraoral side, if it is planned in a way, then I don't think soft tissue actually is creating a problem. Okay. Thank you, sir. thank you, sir. So we'll move to the next case. That is so, a yeah. unilateral so, defect. Uh, if I can, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in yeah, this, uh, if we can see the anterior maxilla as well as the anterior nasal, anterior nasal spine is also missing. Yes, so, yes. I mean, we are not able to see the facial photograph, but we have seen cases where even the support of the lip as well as the nose, the support to the nasal septum is also missing. Yes. So you may need to do something anteriorly. Mm. So. Pardon, pardon. So anteriorly, I think in this case, the anterior nasal spine is also missing. Yes, yes. 
that is a common problem with bilateral cases right yes so like our first phase always fibula but uh, we need to do something for the anterior portion because zygoma support the posterior portion. but uh, to 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 uh, uh, to that way patient is not having any complaint regarding the loss of nasal spine when the patient has uh, come to come to us post operatively his nasal structure i sorry i do not have the facial photographs but i can tell you from the patient we have that patient was absolutely fine from the nose aspect i would say his appearance was absolutely normal like it was pre operatively okay and there was no uh, the only uh, thing missing was the support of the lip specifically from the buccal aspect which we are going to replace with the prosthesis so that's why i asked the question to dr gunjan that do we really need to go for the free free flaps in such cases when the patient is not having any complaint from that aspect your point sir yeah i, I think uh, like as we are doing it so i am not promoting yeah, fibula yeah, in this yeah, yeah 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 but like any like the zygoma in myocor case i think i i am not much experienced with zygoma but uh, the zygoma for atrophic maxilla is different from zygoma doing in myocor i yes. think option to the like um, opinion of other people who are commonly doing it because yes. here the support of lateral postural lateral wall of maxilla is not there so it is directly telescoping to the zygoma so the forces being delivered is directly to the zygoma from masticatory forces yes. so the you know, long term studies we are still not aware of that and the the case you showed like what we call a pin tract infection the food lodgement so it may lead to some infection to the implant and implant loosening later on my 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 um, next question to dr haran sir sir here in this case we are using the we have used the conventional zygoma which has the uh, rough surface rough surface third part which will osteo integrate in the body of the zygoma now compared to that when we are using the psi which is using which is a subperistyle implant and a screw so i don't think that part is going to osteo integrate with the body of zygoma if i am not wrong i would like to take the opinion of dr nihal in that case so do you think that will create any it it will like uh, by in there from that point of view if you are using the implant which can osteo integrate with the body of zygoma it will be helpful for the patient in the future i think nehal has very well validated that point that it still awaits the follow up uh, sort of a thing because nobody has a long follow up on the psi implants and we'll have to just wait and see what is going to happen with uh, whatever has been implanted uh having said that there is one disadvantage that i feel the psi has maybe of uh, the weight that it would be uh, subjecting the maxillary uh, bone which has just healed to uh, uh for the for doing the prosthesis and everything and suspending it from the uh, super uh, superficial part of the zygoma as against that uh, the zygoma that we place zygomatic implants uh, that we place conventional zygoma implants they have a uh, uh, two varieties one has the rough surface one has the smooth surface the polished implants uh, and uh, with the help of guides we can uh, engage them and it is a time tested thing what gunjan was pointing out actually uh, uh, about uh, but that is the specific purpose of the cord zygomas that you can uh, immediately load them also once you achieve the desired level of torque uh, there is a clear indication that you can go for immediate loading only that in these cases because they are post infective healing we just try to give it time and then we might go for a secondary reconstruction even after placing them thank you thank also, you can i answer yeah sure sure go ahead please so uh, i forgot to mention in my lecture that this screws basically you see you have to understand the orthopedic concept of the placing a screw these all screws majority of them are placed without drilling they are self drilling screw so either yes. they are most of the time it is a bone compression which you use for basically a basal implant it's a same yes, yes, concept sir. we are using second thing i i am uh, i know i mean as dr haran said long term results are still Please. awaited i am Uh, we are trying to actually do uh, a hydroxy appetite coating of the few screws so that uh, at least two or three screws which are going inside 
it get osteo integrated and third thing is i think the uh, uh, diameter of the screw is most important here uh, most of the psi what we i have seen is 1.5 mm millimeter diameter which is not going to hold the actually the load which is uh, coming from the occlusal side so either it has to be a 2 or 2.3 millimeter and a uh, few of the screws you have to use a locking screw basically so that even if so total number of screws should not be less than at least 9 when you use this psi on either side okay and total 18 screws so but see it is like a, a newer thing and we are still awaiting the definitely. long term result definitely definitely but, definitely yeah yeah so we'll move to the next case sir uh we in one doctor vivek gaur also pardon pardon doctor vivek gaur is there sorry sir doctor vivek sir i don't sorry, is, is he online yeah he is online he is online okay. but he is i think he is not available with us sir i know okay i'm going to join him yeah okay he is not Fine. not available with us so now uh, uh, next case uh, that is a unilateral case okay where we have the one side and ma total maxillectomy and the other side i would say just an adulectomy was done the natural teeth are available from the uh, uh, canine to the rest of the uh, teeth on the left side we have a good volume of zygoma available uh, yeah so here my my question will be sir to uh, i think dr nihal has very nicely answered it but still i would like to take your other op uh, opinions on the opinions of the other panelist when we are placing an incision to avoid the problem which we have faced in the earlier case where we had long shank and as dr uh, uh, sankal also said that we should not put an incision at the junction of the palatal and buccal mucosa so it has to be either it should be preferably should be on the buccal side so that we do not have the oro nasal communication or so rather than doing that shouldn't we be putting an incision more onto the palatal aspect and then raising the complete flap will it be helpful more because in that way we are preserving the buccal mucosa also and simultaneously we are avoiding the chances of oro nasal communication also to your take sir uh, i would like to throw this question to dr pethani sir yes dr kausam yeah uh, two points which i have experienced in such cases if we give more palatal incision then okay. the dissection will be little very difficult difficult very, very difficult rather if we give buccal incision just above the zygoma or at the base of zygoma okay. and if we put the polished or unpolished collar of zygoma above the palatal mucosa at a desirable length it okay. will work but uh, definitely all the processes what we usually do is we keep a little space above the processes impression surface so that patient have uh, that water jet cleaning yes yes or even uh, they can use proxa uh, proxa brushes definitely definitely and definitely. Uh, i think it will not give uh, uh, either benefit or loss to the final outcome of the processes or even surgery Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Can I say something, Kausto? Yeah, yeah. Please, please go ahead. So I think here, uh, Neil, I would like Neil's opinion also because these are the challenging cases for the zygoma when it comes to unilateral. Because zygoma classically should always have a bilateral splinting yes. for stability for the processes and everything. The other problem that we see with unilateral one is getting the angulation right when teeth are present. right as we have already experienced uh, if you if i have to put two zygomas with the opposing teeth present it becomes a real challenge right wherein i compromise i either with the angulation or maybe i end up only placing one zygoma and then i have to think of placing an implant diagonally above the roots of the teeth on, on the opposite side or something like that so yeah. this is one specific place where i think that psi has a has a better role play if uh, we have encouraging results from that i think i uh, we would like to have neil's opinion on that yeah what i have faced here is the, the my next question was here was in this case is the main problem was achieving the good anterior posterior spread of the two zygoma implants because the opposing side dentition was very much causing problem while we are drilling so when 
if if we have placed the posterior implant first the problem was when we, to achieve the good anterior posterior spread we we had tried to put the zygoma implant over here but this tooth was not allowing us to go that horizontally right so in such cases what we if we are going for the double zygoma or dual zygoma we cannot say quad zygoma but we are saying a dual zygoma is there any clinical point or clinical uh, way by which we can avoid this problem uh what i would uh, throw this question to kaushik sir if you have any experience or any harin sir any of you please or i have not done uh, uh, conventional zygoma in such cases rather unilateral okay uh, uh, because it is not up to the midline or it is going beyond the defect is going beyond midline so the patient specific implant should work well in this case okay 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 also Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, yeah yeah please sir Yeah, so see this case i already showed the design two design which uh, uh, yes. so you have to define yeah. one is crossing the midline or when is one is near the midline when it is crossing the midline say the defect like this so here uh, what uh, i design is usually take a, a anchorage from the opposite side of piriform but the bar bar would definitely go above the attachment uh, at the edge there So uh, two small incision again, one on the right side directly over the zygoma. Place the conventional PSI what I showed you. Other side, just uh, put a small incision on the vestibular region and fix the uh, uh, single stud PSI so that it does not impinge on the attaching gyma. So it is same as uh, fixing our plate. The only advantage here is you see only a small abutment which is coming out uh, from that. but when it is near the midline that design doesn't work so that's the reason i would send the another design where you just give a support uh, from the uh, nasal area the anus area where you just put a three screws which is connected directly to the uh, uh, the outer stud or the bar okay right right so uh, one more question i would like to add here is that suppose we have what we have used is the dual zygoma now as dr harin sir well said that whenever we are using the zygoma it has to be counter supported from the opposite side now in the opposite side as we know that from this canine beyond the, in front of this anterior to this canine we do not have any good bone to place an implant so is it wise to put an angulated implant using the bone above the roots of the teeth or is it wise to just sacrifice only one tooth like canine and put an implant over here because if you are using an angulated implant or about the roots of the natural teeth what about the future when the patient requires any kind of implants when he when he will be missing or when he will be requiring a replacement of any of this tooth because we have already used that bone so what's your takes uh, kaushik sir i think you're right uh, for yeah. angulation or angulated implant in that area is difficult mm -hmm. uh, practically it would be better if we extract and put one implant yeah. with multi unit abutment so that it can have uh, the lateral forces which are checked yes okay yeah good good so i'll, I'll just go forward with the case what we have done we have done dual zygoma and we have utilized as we were able to achieve a good uh, bone when we have opened the flap we have been able to use a good a bone above the roots of the canine so we have just used one angulated implants and uh, uh, what we have done is that we have used the multi unit to achieve a good parallelism still this patient is in the pre op phase we have not done the prosthesis because the case has been done just few months back now uh, one more case where we see a very small defect the patient is not having any big defect like this so uh, my 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 question will be here to uh, dr gyan sir so what would you or and dr gunjan sir what would you like to do with this defect uh, how to close this kind of defect intra op pre op post op what what will be your go in this such cases uh, i think it depends on what uh, the what we have you are selecting Like okay. going for a free flaps and there, there is no question yeah. because automatically it will be taken care of. Or yeah. else it seems to be a very small defect, so I think a small rotation flap may be done. Okay, rotational flap, parallel rotational flap. You are saying. Yeah, preferably. But sir, we do not have the bone in the parallel part. 
the pellet part palatal bone has been removed mm -hmm. then would the palatal rotation flap will work because otherwise it will again create the defect there in the donor side mm -hmm. i think on the left side it seems little intact right so i think uh, is gonna the vaccinectomy is done on left side or no i don't don't think so we have a palatal bone available here okay yeah no, but only soft tissue can also work. Like what we do yeah. for F palate cases, like where yeah. it is bone, yeah. bone, but only soft yeah. tissue coverage. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, your care, your your take, Doctor Gyan. Um, sir, because there is a lot of fibrosis here. This is secondary. Cleft palate cases are primary. Okay. So there is chance. You are right. It, there are chances that if you do only this, it will might open. But if you are anyways doing only palatal processes, in sense you've already put. Uh, zygoma implants and doing uh, a prosthesis there. Mm -hmm. We're not doing anything. We're not bringing any foreign tissue. You, the only option left to you is rotation. So okay. you'll have to rotate this and see how it stays there. There are chances it might open. There are chances it might stay as it stays in cleft. Okay. And other option, maybe you may do a tongue flap, like yeah. what is being done for. <coughs> tongue, tongue, tongue flap is better in this case, I guess. Pardon, pardon. Tongue flap is better in this case, I guess. Okay. Okay. Or what we have done here is that we have gone with Dr. Sankal sir that we such kind of defects, we would like to close it just with the prosthesis. Okay. Because we, there was lots of fibrosis. What we have done in this case, we tried to initially, before doing the surgery, we tried to doing, uh, close the defect with the uh, facial attack, but it didn't work. And then this is the case which we are seeing after the failure of the facial lata. So that's why what we had that we do, we had lots of fibrosis even after the facial lata failure. So what we had done is that we had done the quad zygoma and we have used the prosthesis directly to close the defect here so that it, it, it doesn't at least doesn't give any kind of regurgitation of fluid to the patient. This is the post of picture of the prosthesis. Now, that was a small defect which, which, which we have been able to manage with the prosthesis. That's fine, it is working nicely. But when we have a good big defect like this, right? So, here, uh, my question to uh, uh, Gunjan, sir. Sir, when the patient in such cases, if we can do the free flaps, as you said, it's very nice, it's ideal thing. But sometimes, as we know that when we are talking about the uh, free flaps, patients are always reluctant to get the another donor surgery, right? So what will be your, your go in that case? Is what, how would you like to close this defect? Any other option other than the free flaps? Other than free flaps, like when you're talking about free flap, I mean, there are two options, like the one which we are, I think Gyan has shown, fibula, which we are commonly doing. The other thing which is uh, being recently published is the zip flap, zygomatic implant perforated flap. So they okay. do a radial forearm flap. It has been recently published okay. and they put a zygomatic implant. So that is another option. And the other option, if the patient is not fit for a microvascular or not I mean, I economically it. sound, then one can also go for uh, like what we said, tongue flap or a removable processes or something that kind of. Okay. Yes. Right. Right. Your, your take Kausik, sir. Now that is what even I am thinking because, uh, uh, for free flap to take the pedicle from internal jugular vein to the palate is, I think it, it will need a lot of uh, dissection within the normal soft tissue. Plus, uh, given the cost, time and morbidity, we have to think. Uh, practically, uh, either PSI or zygoma implants. And uh, finally, to give a removable processes for the hygiene is... I think okay. Uh, okay. a simpler option. Okay. Okay. I have not uh, used yeah. any free flap, so I am yeah. not able to add comment something. on that. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, I would want to first at the onset correct one thing. See the experience of us doing free flaps, be it a soft tissue or a hard tissue flaps, is very limited. We have started doing it, so probably I have been doing it for past five years. So. Uh, we as physicians itself, we have a certain limitation. We don't, uh, we have never seen these things work. Our confidence gets transferred to the patients. That is why patients first say no. So it takes a long time. And as Dr. Bethani said correctly, that it, it does require a lot of, a lot of uh, dissection. But you have to see that it is already missing till 
uh, first molar and second molar region. Yeah. So once you are anyways going to open, if you decide to do a free flap, say either a soft tissue or a hard tissue flap, the pedicle does not matter. It has to come. So we've been doing that for a very long time. And in all those cases, which I discussed today, every case has, has had a challenge to reach, take the pedicle down there. But we have come up with uh, solutions and it has worked. So it, these are challenges that Dr. Nehal is facing challenges in his uh, PSI. We are facing in ours. We've come overcoming all those. And I must tell you with a good confidence that whatever is said and done, it is anterior defect, posterior defect, small defect, bigger defect. Uh, patients, as far, as far as the patient is stable to undergo a procedure, and cost is not a matter now. So I would say uh, PSI, I'm, see, I'm anyways biased, but I just want to clear one thing here. The first hurdle to give a good cosmetic and functional outcome in form of free flaps is ours, is our own. Once we understand that you have, we have, we all as a community have to understand that it is not a problem. It is just that we were not doing it in the past. Nobody is, wants to venture into maxillary reconstruction because it, is a, it has a lot of problems. Plus it might fail. So, but we have successfully been able to overcome one problem over another and we have got good results in last those 10, 11 cases in which we've got opportunity to do. So yes, I, if, you, if a patient says we can do temporal flap, we can do a soft tissue zip flap, we can do a tongue flap to close, we can do a zygoma. But if you say, okay, I want to get it done, can you do it? Yes, we can do it. Yes, I am confident to get a good result. That is what I wanted to put across. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Your, your take, Nihal, sir? Yeah, I, I think Gyan has mentioned everything. Uh, I would, I see, but the reason I was avoiding all these cases is I was uh, skeptical to start something which has not been established. I mean, there are a huge number of follow-up of the PSI, but they are done on the uh, uh, conventional atrophic maxilla yeah. and mandible. Nice. Uh, this type of defect we have seen first, but considering the technicality, the literature, the material science, the uh, digital uh, planning, we have come uh, to the era where you can predict at least the adaptation of the bone. So it is, you, you take an orthopedic literature, there is a huge literature on the compression uh, plates, compression plates where it works on a compressive strength. So if you take the principle from them and implement in our area, I think uh, see, I am still not sure that what will be my results. I am still awaiting for one year CT scan of this. But till now, eight months, uh, we had our own problems. We are improvising. We have changed the design. This type of defect, I think we are going to uh, try to close it with the PSI. Uh, uh, I think I am still designing. I am not sure. But right now, if you ask me, I would ask somebody to close this defect with the Whatever yeah. flap they so, can uh, and so, so my question is that such huge defects can be directly closed with the PSI without no, any no, suspicion? absolutely, absolutely no, no. Yeah. absolutely no. Mm -hmm. You cannot place a metal in that defect. Yeah, absolutely. You have to close this defect only either with the flap or a prosthesis which is obturator where patient can remove themselves. Okay. So if I construct, if I design a PSI also, it will be a same two-piece design. The only difference is the process is where there will be a, uh, uh, I mean, it is an obturator which will close the defect. We, I, I cannot, you cannot put a metal in that defect or you yeah. cannot put a single piece PSI which you think that that can close that defect. It is going okay. to fail for sure. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, and to add, if I, if I yeah, yeah, please, yeah. please go ahead. So ultimately, see what we have, we are doing is ultimately by metal, by even though it is a very good metal or titanium. So fibula has an advantage of it is patient's own bone. So yes. the patient is not dependent on a metal or a foreign body. So once the fibula is fused, you can remove the plate, recon plate or a mini plates. We can remove it. But there, even at a long term, maybe five years, ten years, fifteen years, patient can have failure with the plate. Or a PSI or a magnetic implant. So that is the biggest yes, advantage. Of the so you you cannot close the defect just with the PSI. Or if you are just placing a PSI, it is, you have to use it like a zygoma implant and put an obturator. I would, right now I would definitely go with any type of flap for a closure of this defect. Yeah. 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 Yeah
I mean, that depends on a gyan and gunjan. I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. so you have, the ideal thing is to, to close the defect from nasal cavity. Only then will a PSI survive. So unless it is communicating yes. the nasal bone, it, the yes, nasal bone is going to survive. Any right, metal yes. is not going to survive. Right, right, right. So uh, just to go at it with the case. So this was the, what as I'm biased towards the conventional zygoma, what I have done is that I've done the quad zygoma placement. Then after the placement, we had a, this defect. We had a good amount of palatal uh, buccal mucosa and some amount of palatal mucosa available. So with the use, with the help of uh, Dr. Gan, we have hired a temporalis flap in that case, this case, and we transported it intravenously. As the maxillectomy was already done, it was easier for us to transport the temporalis flap into the uh, oral cavity, and we have closed the defect primarily using the uh, temporalis localized flap. As we do not have the privilege to go for the free flap from the patient side, we had to use some kind of local flap to close the defect. So we have used right, the right. temporalis flap right. in this case. Right. Again, in this case, right. we might have to go for a debulking in the post office when we will be starting the, uh, what I can say, the prosthetic part. As you can see in my multi units on the left side where we have done the uh, temporalis has been completely embedded within the flap right now. So your, sir, uh, your Dr. Gyan, your take on this, when we will be doing the opening for the multimeter, will, we, will it be causing any kind of again communication because of the fibrosis? No, 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 not at all. See, so if you are, if you are going to immediately load it in a, say in a month or two months time, it will, you will not, it will be embedded. But if you give it time, say three months to three months and over, okay. the uh, temporalis initially over granulates and then it reduces in size and bulk. Okay. Okay. So then it might be easy for you to uh, uncover this screws, but in whatever case it might be, mm -hmm. however amount of muscle you remove, it is not going to create a, a communication because the bulk of muscle behind this oral cavity is a great amount, which will cause uh, separation of the nasal cavity with the oral cavity. You okay. are not going to expose anything. So Dr. Kausija, your, any, your experience with the temporal is flap, is there any you would like to take? Oh, the word? No, no. Okay. 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 Now, the last uh, one mandibular mucormycosis case, which uh, this is, um, as we all know that in mandible, whenever there is a mucor, it completely destroys the medullary part and we are only left with the buccal and palatal plate. So this is the small video of a pre-op picture, pre-op video that we having a very thin uh, kind of mandible remaining after the surgery. So, uh, my question to uh, uh, what do you say, Harin sir? Harin sir is there? Yes. Yeah. Sir, if we do any kind of implant, let's say we are doing a PSI or let's say we are doing a single piece implants or whatever, what will be the chances of pathological fracture when we uh, post-operatively in such cases? Do you think it might be a problem in the in the future and or intraoperatively when we are drilling? Specifically, when uh, when I, I I was having that doubt when uh, Neil sir was showing this video of the mandibular case when he was removing the bone from the mandible. In such cases where we have already lost so much of bone and the mandible is weakened, what will be the chances of pathological fracture when we are doing the PSI in such cases? Uh, PSI, I think, he is the best person to answer because we, as a team, also we have not had experience with PSI. Yeah. Because if we need more of skipping, we are actually compromising the blood supply of the remainder of the thing. It is already mm -hmm. that is the only thing which I hold as a drawback for uh, PSI if you are placing it that way. The other problem that I see is uh, right, the right. quantum of. Uh, the be required, be it a PSI, whatever, it has to travel from the uh, depth of the defect to the uh, point of occlusion. So that will be a huge cantilever uh, which will be uh, there to restore and rehabilitate. Uh, that might increase the bulk of the processes, whatever we are using, and that may also increase the amount of scripting that might be required uh, or yes. the soft tissue detachment which might be required to accommodate. Yeah. Your take, Vivek, sir. Your take, Vivek, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, I had because I'm doing lots of atrophic cases, so I had experience of pathological fractures also. So the thing is, pathological pathological fracture doesn't happen like in a uh, is it is I'm audible? Yes, yes, you're audible, sir. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
the pathology please understand why the pathological fracture is happening because the mandible wherever the mandible is having a less than 10 mm of the bone available then we are having a very old model bone is there there's no remodeling is occurring actually very old model is there so the moment actually you do the perforations and if the perforation is there through and through till to the base uh, then there is a high chance of pathological fractures is occur occurring and basically most of the time pathological fracture occurs at the left hand side hmm. but if when we are doing we don't want to perforate the base we just want to engage the base then plus and the pathological fracture occur between 3 to 6 feet before that is not happening and the trauma is it's trauma means actually the patient if the occlusion is not getting properly corrected then this this are creating a trauma but if i find a cases where let's say resection has been happened or the because of the mucor marcuses or may, maybe anything the muscle mandibular mandibulectomy has been done or part of the mandible has been removed so what has happened the the what has happened the the bone already started getting getting remodeled so now okay. we are having chance of pathological fracture this is i want to emphasize actually pathological yeah. fracture occurs and there's an untouched bone is there if already the resection or something has happened then the uh, the remodeling has started then we are uh, safe from the pathological fracture yes okay. your your technical sir your technical sir yeah so uh, first of all see uh, if you, this particularly this case uh, i mean see i showed you the case the design of this case is very challenging uh, because i already mentioned the problem list uh, yes. first of all the attachment of the muscle directly on the lingual cortex higher lingual cortex than the buccal cortex as far as pathological fracture is concerned uh, i don't i think dr vivek has already mentioned that it is very uh, less chance is during placement Uh, when you design the PSI, uh, you have to design in a two piece. You okay. cannot. Uh, you cannot. Uh, I I actually emphasize this during the zygoma also. You cannot make a single piece PSI where you have to strip the entire, entire uh, uh, buccal and lingual uh, mucosa. If you have seen that case, and third thing, the bone is was not removed because in between the, uh, the buccal and lingual cortex there is no bone. It is usually a granulation tissue. And see, it is like a uh, the first start which comes is in, in the canine region, okay. canine uh, second premolar and the molar. So uh, and it is connected with the very rigid bath. So the when the patient apply force. it actually distribute all entire mandible rather than concentrating on the one place and if you have seen the design the screw which is going from the abutment is actually just uh, engaging the lower cortex rather than coming out of it so uh, see it was done almost 7 month before and he is the patient there was only one case till now i have done because okay uh, PSI in mandible is absolutely technically challenging surgically as well as prosthetically. Definitely. So, <clears throat> but till now he is doing absolutely fine without any. And I, I, as far as his biting force is concerned, he eats everything. Yeah. Your your take. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Your take, uh, Kaushik sir. Your take. Yes. What uh, I am uh, working is a totally different thing. I am planning to go for alveolar distraction in this case. Okay. Which is entry to the mental foramen. I think it will give us the new hard as well as soft tissue. Definitely. And most of the mucor cases of mandible, they have usually now involved. So yes. Uh, most of them will be having paresthesia. Paresthesia so already it, having the it, paresthesia. It usually don't doesn't matter whether we go entry to the mental foramen or even But posterior post to the foramen. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so I am planning two such cases. One is entry to mental foramen where I'll put only one distractor. Okay. And. Uh, the second plan is to go up to the first molar where i'll put two distractor separating from the midline so it will be a vertical distraction sir Ver yes vertical alveolar distractor okay okay uh, okay i'll share if at all i'll, I'll do that case yeah. so then my my question so that, is that will solve all the problems i think that then we can go for conventional implant and we can treat it as a normal mandibular case definitely david so wouldn't be the fibrosis of such because in normal cases Mm. it's okay when we have normal tissue but when we have a fibrous tissue like in such cases will it will it, will not it cause any kind of problem in your distraction no we'll just open the vestibular incision with cautery and we'll uh, cut the bone with saw mm -hmm. without uh, interrupting the uh, lingual mucoperiosteum definitely we would like to uh, see pictures sir if you have 
definitely in the in the if, if you I do it. share yeah sure sure your take vivek sir your take please unmute sir unmute sir yeah uh, yes sir in the dis, uh, the the best part has been just just now mentioned actually in the discussion that when when the they are talking about the subperistal implants or the patient specific implants or with the zygoma or in the mandible they are splitting it so that is the best thing you can do this very nice thing because when the mandible flexion increases when the mandible height is less than 10 mm so it okay. is really this is so the best thing is that that's what i want i appreciate the thought that we if we are splitting the the process we are splitting the cross as splinting that's also a very good thing that is happening actually sir yes mm. all you have to put more number of implants mm. okay good 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 definitely any any other panelist having any other opinion regarding this yes gyan sir yes gyan sir so uh, when we are considering a long procedure and we considering conventional implantology and uh, a surgical phase why not consider a, a free flap a free bone over it see it solves multiple purposes one okay. it will get you native bone as much as you like okay for half the mandible quarter size side the mandible complete mandible you only have a basal bone you need alveolar bone okay. so 10 mm more less than bone which is present 10 mm or more of bone you can get to get a good height yeah. you can do an implant immediate implant and okay. you can delay a process by 3 to 6 months and uh, and load the process definitely second there uh, as compared to maxilla this has a very okay. less advantage very less disadvantage of traveling through the neck traveling going behind the mandible it is right there so mm -hmm. facial artery internal jugular vein are right there so i feel uh, the challenges as compared to maxillary reconstruction in this it is far less and okay. you can get bone you can get muscle to close you can get skin to close you can get a, there is no problem of uh, soft tissue so you can close it well it will heal very well it will reduce very well you can okay. uh, debulk the proceed debulk the flap uh, chair you can place the conventional implants also you can place the conventional implant and you can might as well there have been also reports in literature where they have Uh, used longer implants, longer uh, cortical implants okay. to drill through the fibula into to the, the fibula and engaging the cortical bone. Yes. Yeah. So it in such a case where you are already worried about uh, mandibular uh, fracture, which is very unlikely, very but you are still worried about fibula is going to splint with it. It is going to unite with it. It is going to give you native bone there, which is vascularized, which brings its own vascularity there. It is going to help the whole surrounding. Okay, so sir. Uh, like one more question. Like yeah, it is marginal exactly marginal. like a marginal yeah, mandibular like yes, yes, yes. construction yes. cancers. Yes, yeah. So in such cases, where what what my my one 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 of my queries that when we are when we are treating for the mucor case, when we have opened the flap, it was completely white bone. Okay, it, there was no no stoppage point that where to stop removing the medullary bone. So what when we are doing the surgery. the point to stop was that when we have started seeing the bleeding from the bone okay so do you think is there any chance of not having a proper healing or a, or, or a union of your free flap with the remaining amount of the remaining natural bone no in such in, cases in any case you will have good healing see the very fact that it is surviving still okay the very fact that it is still surviving with good amount of uh, and there is no pathological fracture you are not seeing any defect in the bone now once mm -hmm. you open you will also see see this is what uh, i don't know uh, others also used to call it this is what we call surviving bone so it is not surviving because of the central supply it is surviving because of the periosteal supply yes so it is very imperative that we do not disrupt as we disrupt as little of the periosteal supply as possible okay so yes. we only open it from the top we do not do anything else we put a bone over it we freshen the bone margin on the base and we put a fibula i feel it should get united if not permanent union in osseous forms at least it will have a stable fixation there definitely definitely so reducing so, and removing the less amount of dissection definitely, definitely. so Jan. that <coughs> yes sir yes uh, i have a question when you put a fibula you usually yes, take with the skin paddle right correct so sir how, how do you deal with that skin paddle when you do a prosthesis because what i have seen is when you put a conventional implant any implant forget conventional even in the polished surface implant where i have faced when you put a psi also if it is attached to the skin that is going to get granulated tissue how do you deal with that so uh, two two ways one will be do not harvest skin 
So what we okay. are, what I'm now doing is do not harvest skin. So in, in our own center where we are confident that everything is under our control, do not harvest skin because skin is only for monitoring in such cases. I am assuming that the defect intraorally is not going to be too much. It will also be close. We will also be able to close it by primarily. Skin. Primarily yes. or by muscle only. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we can see uh, one, like see, this. There is no no need of any. Uh, so we harvest fibula bare minimum. In one of the mucor cases, I have harvested bone only. There is no muscle. Completely skeletonized bone. Okay. So you can do that. Can one. I can I add something to that? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. So uh, we have rehabilitated one case of uh, fibula which had been done healed fibula uh, and. Uh, what we did was debulking of the uh, fibula flap and uh, we just brought it to the level of the skin and uh, we placed implants and uh, we gave a, a removable detachable prosthesis on, on that and uh, with some prosthetic issues and all that but it is still working well. Now all the things have been sorted out because it was one of our cases but the patient is still doing well at the end of maybe three years now. So uh, we can comfortably so say that if we do a debulking of that flap, handling of the prosthetic part is not an issue. But it, it definitely adds one big, very big advantage is that it reduces the cantilever on the prosthesis. If you are placing long implant, whether it is a basal implant or whether it is any form of implant, it has to travel from the defect to the occlusal surface. And that is a lot of cantilever. If With PSI, again, there can be exposed surfaces into the oral cavity which is possible. And so as Gyan has suggested, I think it is something that we should uh, look into and it definitely uh, gives a lot of promise. When yeah. all this cantilevering is also there and uh, cantilevering is also uh, done away with and we get uh, uh, enough bone also to put our uh, conventional implants and be more in a predictable zone rather than an unpredictable zone. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just add a small point to complete Nail's question is, the second part I was going to tell you was you can even do the uh, even Haren sir sir you can even debulk the uh, fibula after say 21 days or six weeks time so you don't even have to now I'm this I'm talking about mucor cases only not for cancer so you these cases you can do an early debulking debulking to an extent that you can leave the bore ba bone bare. So your okay. problems of soft tissue management, uh, Nehal sir, your problems of soft tissue management over the conventional free fibula uh, uh, grafting will get sorted out. If, if one by you can harvest less amount of skin and minimal muscle. Two, do an immediate or a uh, four to six weeks delayed complete debulking of the fibula under local anesthesia or on chair side <coughs> without even any, giving any anesthesia. Different. Different. So any, uh, I would like to just like to finish this case as I am biased towards my basal implants. So this is what we have planned as we are not worried about the inferior now, now right now. So what we have tried to engage is the lower border of the mandible. And uh, this was the model which we have planned. And this is how we wanted the uh, post-op picture. And this is what we have achieved. Okay, the advantage was that we didn't have to go for any kind of uh, flap removal and everything. We could then directly snap on fittings and we could give a nice hygienic prosthesis to the patient. And this is now almost uh, say three to four months old picture now and it's working very nicely. Um, any, 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 any take your, any, uh, your takes sir, Vivek sir? I hope we have justice to the case from your point of view. Uh, so you did very nicely, sir. So what I want to mention also one more thing when we're talking about actually when the skin graft is there, so I always, because I am getting the cases where already the fibula is there and I'm doing all flap test. I just keep it one thing very simple or actually when I'm doing the cases with the resection cases or the mucor micro cases. And nowadays we are saying mucor micro, otherwise actually we were all talking about the, the resection cases only. So we always have to keep, the one thing we should keep in mind, the abutment should be at least should have three millimeter of the sanitary with the, with the, with the tissue bag. Okay. So if the abutment three millimeter is, away from the tissue. Yes, sir. If the abutment is in contact with the soft tissue, then always you'll find out uh, the soft tissue is with the, they are going to have rub, they will be rub actually along with the, your abut implant abutment. And there always actually a problem will be there. And I've seen the seepage of the, uh, the infection also. So that's my, my point was actually whatever we does, actually, if we keep a sanitary process, that is the best thing yes. we can do for them. Definitely, definitely, definitely. 
definitely so sir i will start operating thank you sir <laughs> thank you thank you vivek sir for your time yes, thank, thank you. you so much yes, thank you so sir. much yes. and with this we will come to the last case for the discussion yeah now, this i am present the... for this case yes i am present <laughs> yeah thank you thank you sir so uh, uh, this is the this is the case courtesy from my institution amc dental college and hospital this is the patient which we have received uh, just few uh, few days back patient has already been operated for mucor okay now patient is not having any complaint or any kind of pus discharge or anything but when we took the post okay, this opg patient is having still this kind of picture which looks like the patient is still having an active mucormycosis or like while patient is not having any complaint patient is looking for a rehabilitation right now in this case so what should be our approach in this case what what we should be doing in this case uh, gunjan sir your take i think uh, as you said the disease is very stable on right zygoma so yeah. we not it, it may be a, a non vascular necrosis rather than an active infection or active fungal yeah infection. yes yes so i think this case we may consider a primary reconstruction rather than waiting for a secondary reconstruction so i okay. think with if you ask me <laughs> free fibula would be the ideal choice because definitely. it's a bilateral maxilla but sir definitely free fibula or any kind of prosthesis we will be dealing my question here is that what we should be doing about that non healthy bone so we should definitely remove it yeah because so after the removal is not bleeding we should remove it yeah so what should be our approach suppose if you are going for a free flap in this case yes what should be our approach should be first remove all this non vascular bone close it and then go for free flap in the second second stage or we can do it in the one go only so as i said if there is no active infect it may be just a non vascular necrosis a vascular okay. necrosis so i think okay. we can go with primary reconstruction okay. so we can remove this remove this whatever portion okay and cure it out if you see the bleeding bone and soft tissue you can go for okay. primary we okay. have i think two or three cases we have done like this okay uh, i think no problem till yet so i think we can go for primary reconstruction okay okay you are take kaushik sir Yes, uh, Dr. Kautu. I have uh, seen around five to six cases during mucor mycosis, uh, in which the whole, even frontal bone was uh, osteo uh, was affected by osteomyelitis, and by uh, treating with uh, pentoxifilin, vitamin E, and long-term antibiotics like doxycycline, it healed well. So after around eight months, I am seeing a good. Uh, a uh, kind of uh, calcification in the uh, skull base frontal bone as well as the zygomatic bone it looks like uh, in this case so uh, i think if we can give around 4 to 6 months to such cases and keep on monitoring it will have so this normal... is this is 7 months post op yes but still we can wait if you do uh, it is can even up 3 uh, uh, months like at uh, interval of 10 months it should have more calcification as compared to this uh, this city that okay. is what i have okay. experienced in last five cases okay okay um just just go to the like your your take nihal sir i think nihal sir is not first i yeah yeah no, i have i have eight cases like this where we waited for more than uh, uh, first wave uh, where i i have a serial ct scan of almost uh, eight k uh, three cases that i don't know whether it is mineralized or not but there is no defect so it may resolve if bone is not not exposed to the oral cavity the dead bone is not exposed to say there is a frontal bone which is not exposed to the oral cavity or any sinus cavity you can wait it may expose okay. or it may resolve okay, okay. question nail sir my question is it might remain there it might stay there will such yeah. bone be able to take up load no i we are not rehabilitating you okay. wait for it okay you don't have to do anything you just wait yeah. for you explain to the okay. patient that unless and until you are see there are two things can happen either this bone will get infected it will if it is exposing in the oral cavity or if it is communicating in those cases you definitely have to remove it but if say i have a case where there is a there was a spinoid bone which was showing a initial demineralization we waited we started pentoxifilin and uh, vitamin e and then after 6 month if, if you see uh, bone is there patient does not have any complaint same way there is one patient where zygoma actually one side of but you don't you don't load that but, patient that is my question that. if if this say if everything goes well and the bone mineralizes zygoma you will seem that it is mineralized it is stable it is not exposed 
Now, after say one and a half years of waiting and good result, good outcome as expected by you, will you load such plus such bone with uh, either PSI or zygoma? No, I'll I'll go for uh, I, uh, either free flow or something, because see, you, I, I, it is not mineralized. I don't think that 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 bone can any day mineralize. It is so a natural bone. It is it is arrested bone can never mineralize. It is a resorption. So what you will find is basically a fibrous tissue rather than the bone. Mm. Right, so, right, right. I mean, so, it, it so, is not going to mineralize. Okay, okay, okay. Um. So in if I can put some throw some more light onto the picture, this this patient is uh, having. a good primary closure available right now okay patient's age is in the mid 40s right now and uh, he his main concern right now is the rehabilitation so we have tried to convince the patient for the free flap also we have tried to convince the patient for the first uh, surgery for the removal of the non healthy bone and then go for the uh, uh, rehabilitation with the free flap suppose patient is not ready for any kind of free flaps then what we should be doing if it is a closed defect wait don't don't do okay. anything right now if there is no till what time till what time till what time till, till, till how many months it, if it is 8 month i would still wait for another 6 month to see okay right. okay and then then if if it they resolve and that that would 90% so after 6 that, months we'll again get the ct done if yes. then we should be expecting a good healthy bone no i am not saying you are expecting the healthy bone that bone which is necros you may find the radio lucent area or the okay. periphery of that will be a healthy bone see it okay. is like if it is an infected bone and it is a primary if it is not it is a necros bone it's not infected it is a demineralized okay. bone which has been detached from the body or health healthy bone so 99% of the time what happen is if it is not exposed to the oral cavity the body will act as, it will consider it as a foreign body and try to resolve it so when it resolve it is not going to form a bone it is going to form a fibrous tissue and after taking a 6 month ct scan i would decide whether what type of uh, prosthesis has to be given in this case i would definitely ask patient for the go for a free fibula even if after 6 month i mean see you cannot take a chance so in in any which case i don't think you should operate it twice in yeah. sense once to remove the bone and then to do a reconstruction yeah. or rehabilitation in any which case you should do it only once take the patient once decide it have a uh, have a objective approach of yes and no whatever situation you find we should be ready with one or the other of the options and do it and come out one surgery Yeah. Yes. Good. I mean, see, either wait or you do it immediately. Correct. Okay. Good. Any, any, any other uh, uh, add-ons from any other panelist? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would. <clears throat> with this, I think we have. We would like to conclude our uh, this scientific session on rehabilitation of mucormycosis. Is Dr. Hitesh sir available? No, I think he is not available with us. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, I would like you to conclude. Yeah, I'm available. Well, uh, well, I would like to thank uh, Kausal yourself and Vimesh thank you, to thank handle you, sir. it to handle it so well, and to keep the grip on the panel discussion is such a difficult task. Thank you. And uh, uh, you know. these cases they are in the visible state so your audio and is your audio is breaking focus of doing this symposium definitive answers for this uh, difficult yeah. is it clear yeah i think i think dr hitesh clear you are not audible Hello. sir yeah now we are you are audible sir Yeah, is my audio clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now it's. Yeah, so I would like to thank all the panelists and the speakers to spare their valuable time and uh, give us wonderful insights for uh, 
these difficult uh, cases to handle and yeah. hopefully in the long run as nehal told uh, you wait for the long term follow up of psis and uh, zygomas uh, yeah. from and probably we will have some definitive solutions innovation through technology and continuous learning is probably the key definitely. so this discussions like this will definitely going to bring yeah. out the best yeah. possible outcome and thank you gyan for opening up a site which is the fibula which is uh, not being practiced by many oral surgeons definitely. but it definitely gives us a huge amount of option for the uh, proper uh, contouring of the uh, residual bone so i, I thank everybody i think we have to say something i think we have something to say yes please. Uh, sir actually i i got disconnected sorry sir uh, the, for the last case what they were showing sir what it was there in the screen so the another option is no it's not a option actually the another treatment modality is we should you know the hyperbaric oxygen therapy also because this okay. is what tan monis is there and i am originally of bangalore and mazumdar and uh, this cancer hospital so okay. there actually uh, there actually uh, this uh, he has done actually with 80 dives of the uh, of of the of the That's therapy you. And the result actually was remarkably within a one year. The result was very very fine. Excellent results were there actually, sir. Okay. okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Good point, sir. Good point. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Thank you, Kostub. I think thank we you, are sir. at the end of our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Time. Thank you for your participation for the scientific session. Thanks a lot. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.